Okay, thank you. We have adjourned out of um, the Student Advisory Council meeting and we are now going to enter into the, um, the full Northampton School Committee meeting. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, so good evening. Welcome to the May 12th Northampton School Committee meeting. I'm Mayor Jean-Louis Shara, the chair of the school committee and I'll be presiding. This meeting is being held remotely on Zoom pursuant to the modification of the state's open meeting law for, COVID, for the pandemic. And this meeting and all participating on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. Um, we, have, uh, we took the role already, so we can move on to our next agenda item, which is public comment. If you wish to make a comment, please use the raise hand feature in the bottom menu bar under reactions. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. Before you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. I'll set a three minute timer to ensure everyone has an equal, equal opportunity to speak. And I ask that all but the school committee turn off your video until called upon because only the person recognized has the floor. So we will start with, I can't see full names. Um, Emily Body, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thanks. I am Emily Body. I'm a resident and parent in Northampton. And I'm also a co-founder of Mask Choice Pioneer Valley. And thanks for listening to me tonight. I understand that DESE's current guidance says that districts seeing rapid increases in COVID-19 cases should, quote, work with DESE, local board of health, and DPH epidemiologists to review and assess the mo most recent testing results, discuss strategies to control the spread, and determine additional measures to be taken, unquote. I get that, but these measures need to be lawful. Sure, districts can say there is a mandate and require certain types of masks over others. However, they have no legal authority to enforce said mask requirement. As we know from the publicly available MOU dated 331-22 out of Leverett Elementary School pertaining to the same matter, enforceability of mask mandates that are issued in the absence of state and federal mandates. Quote, exclusion of students is currently not permissible under law. Board of Education and or state federal government has sole authority to implement exclusion of students as a consequence of failure to wear masks pursuant to a mandate, unquote. I posed the following question in an email to Dr. Provost at-large member Gwen Agna and my own member, Meg Robbins, and I did not receive a response. I realize that you will not answer me as a participant in public comment, but I will ask the question anyway for all to hear. Please, will you explain how NPS assumes power to remove a student for not wearing a mask, as happened Wednesday to at least two students in the district, while Leverett has determined this is not lawful? Where is the end game here? Perpetual masking of children whenever you feel like it and unlawfully? We have ample data from the past two years that school mask mandates are not effective. Masking children causes harm. Our children deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Patrick. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right. My computer seems to be having some issue with my video and it's not working. So I'm just gonna speak. Um, okay. Apologies. Okay. Um, good evening, members of the school committee, mayor, uh, superintendent provost, and everybody else listening. <clears throat> my name is Patrick Bowen. Um, I'm a parent of uh, the elementary school student. And I'm also speaking as a member of Mass Choice Pioneer Valley. Um, the Northampton School seems to have chosen to embroil themselves in this controversy again and divide our community and our student body by re-implementing a mask mandate. An outdated measure that an assessment of across the board scientific, scientific data shows is ineffective. And if you look at our nearby communities that has, have recently made changes to their mask policy, policies, it's mask recommendations at this point and not mandating masks because of the legal measure just outlined by um, 
the sorry show. Um, <laughs> um, the reason that they're not mandating is because they're not allowed to do that under state law. It's because he's, if you go to enforce it as the last commenter was describing, you violated state law by withholding education from students. Um, so when East Hampton, Amherst and Leverett who are previously peer cities and falling on this level of COVID intensity, there are no long, now Northampton is alone in trying to do this policy. Additionally, when you don't have an, an exception process, you're violating the Federal Americans with Disability Act or ADA that requires such an exemption process to be in place for any sort of mandate on along these lines. So now this Northampton is violating state and federal law. This is on top of the committee's frequent violation of open meeting law. While I've only filed one complaint so far, there have been many other such violations. I know that some members of this committee and committee have adopted a, zero, a tribal zero around masking and make false claims of information against accurate data at odds with the position. Masks work, but mask mandates don't, and especially mask mandates after two years. If you feel that I was previously part of a vocal minority, you can see that's no longer true if you looked around the schools during the past few weeks when the mandate wasn't in place. If there was support for your position, there would have been nearly no change in masking instead there was a dramatic change. CDC publicly available data shows there's no, there's no difference in virus transmission in communities with and without mass mandates. And that over 75% of children in the US already have had COVID. We do have abundant data showing immense learning loss, widespread mental health issues, increased eating disorders, and other anxiety-induced maladies in young girls. The virus is real, but we have a lot of tools to mitigate its effect, namely in vaccinations and antiviral drugs. The virus impacts a small group at any given time, whereas the restrictions impact everyone the whole time they're in effect. I know that many members on this committee don't have basic, the basic info to make these choices. Member Robbins at a recent meeting referred to Director O'Leary as Dr. O'Leary, but she's neither a doctor nor has a master's in public health. She is a registered sanitarian. And unlike a master's in public health, which teaches a holistic view of health and is weighing contingent risks versus happiness connection to mental health, the training of registered sanitarians to focus on control of environmental health. In other words, a sole focus on stopping disease. I feel that this tunnel vision approach to health clearly is showing in Northampton's ongoing incorrect choice of mandates. I ask that Northampton join the current accepted understanding of science on COVID and stop violating state and federal law. All efforts should be focused on getting people boosted, making the public aware of antivirals and undoing the damage we've done to parts of health and education over the past two years. Your campaign should switch back to, back to mass recommended or mass optional immediately, and it should move itself out of legal jeopardy with immense speed and never put our children in this position again. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next is Jeff Napolitano. Hi, um, my name is Jeff Napolitano. Uh, I live in Northampton. I have a kid in NHS and JFK, and I'd like to state my appreciation that masking was re-implemented in the schools. Uh, and I won't go into it, but we totally have peer-reviewed studies, scientific studies that demonstrate that masking prevents transmission of airborne viruses, which I'm sure you all know. Uh, I work at UMass, where just today, as thousands of students were leaving the university to return to their communities, uh, the school announced a test positivity rate of nearly 10%, and in just in my small department of less than a dozen people, two staff members and their families have been infected and are both um, uh, convalescing at home. I know folks who have lost uh, family members to COVID, and I know folks who are dealing with long COVID. I imagine, unfortunately, that many people here do as well. Uh, I know that there is little institutional support in the state or nationally to mitigate, never mind acknowledge, that we do not yet have control over COVID-19. I know that there are severely misled people who think that masks are worse than disease that's killed over a million people in this country as of today. I understand that uh, means that the decision about the safety of literally the air that our children breathe sitting in classes for hours and hours is in your hands. Um, I'm not asking you to maintain masking because our kids have immunocompromised family at home or maybe immunocompromised themselves. I'm not asking you to maintain masking because our kids may have siblings under the age of five unable to be vaccinated. I'm not asking you to debate the chances of getting some of the deleterious effects on the vascular, neurological, pulmonary and other bodily systems of COVID um, or that we don't know the long term effects of infection over and over again. 
I am asking you to imagine that if this wasn't COVID-19, imagine if we had rampant measles or whooping cough in our school. Um, please treat COVID-19 like any other infectious disease and maintain masking because it's simply one of the easiest and most effective things we can do to control a virus. This shouldn't be hard. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brianne Schwartz. Hello, my name is Brianne Schwartz. I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a speech therapist and I have a private practice in Northampton. I also have a kindergartner at Ryan Road. A little more about myself. I have been working with children and families for over 15 years, and I'm a longstanding member of the American Speech Language Hearing Association, and I have a master's degree in speech pathology from Columbia University. And I'm here again to implore the committee to consider the educational repercussions of masking for our children. And I speak both as an educator and as a parent. I believe I can offer information as a speech therapist that must be considered deeply when we make these decisions. And think about what are we truly asking of our children when we ask them to put on a mask. Wearing a mask removes many visual cues that we get from the speaker. Masks attenuate sound by three to 12 decibels and also result in low pass filtering of high frequency sounds. This can make it more difficult to understand speech and some higher pitched voices. Who has higher pitched voices? Kids, especially young children. Masks hide many nonverbal cues, such as smiling. Who are the ones that are learning how to socialize, play, respond to others? Again, those are our kids. Our kids simply cannot communicate well or learn to communicate well while wearing masks. As adults, we have years of pre-pandemic life to draw upon to make conclusions about what, are, what others have said, how they are feeling, how we should act. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old who are living in a masked world. How can this not impact them? Kids learn essentially everything through communication. And when communication is blocked in some way, so is learning and social development. Mask wearing has gone on for so long that it has become a hindrance at best and an imposed learning disability at its worst. My students with communication delays face some of the biggest risks. I receive multiple calls every week from concerned parents Communication problems are growing, and so is my wait list. Last week, I spoke to two separate parents on the same day calling me, saying that their three-year-olds are not speaking yet. As we navigate these developments, we must admit that anytime a child wears a mask, there is a consequence, an educational, social, emotional, developmental consequence. And I ask now what long-term outcomes are we willing to face for our kids when we cover their faces? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Otis Rogers Brightwood. Hi, sorry. Uh, it's my school Zoom. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, uh, an educator in Springfield Public Schools. And before I logged in, I forgot to remove Brightwood. Anyways, hi. I'm Otis Rogers. I live in Bright I live in uh, Florence, and I have a uh, a child who goes to uh, Leeds Elementary School. And first of all, I just want to thank the uh, school committee very much for reinstating the mask mandate. I think it's a wise choice, considering that we are currently dealing with a virus that is about as contagious as measles, uh, which means that it's an airborne disease that will fill a room, and uh, it doesn't take very much for us to be for students to be spreading this from one person to another. We've talked a lot about how maybe there's no exceptions for some students who uh, need to have no mask. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember hearing about something that there's no exceptions for certain uh, students when there's a disability. Um, I know that where I work that some students are, have always been allowed to not wear a mask if that's you know a, a serious issue. Um, 
I also want to say that people talk about serious consequencing of wearing masks. I know that there are, I, I mean, I believe what you're saying about, you know, masks having long-term consequences for children and their emotional well-being. It is hard to wear a mask, but I also want you to take into account that another long-term consequence could be the death of a loved one, perhaps a parent, uh, someone who may be immunocompromised at home. And I also just want to point out one more thing that we don't have to wear masks just about anywhere we, anywhere in the world right now. But we have no choice but to send our children to school. There is no virtual option. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thanks again. Thank you. Next is Emmy. Hi, everybody. Happy spring. <laughs> My name is Emmy Stammel. I'm the mother of a fourth grader who adored her years at um, JSS, Jackson Street. So I'm here tonight to advocate for her and others like her by addressing the reinstatement of the mask mandate. Um, my daughter has significant hearing loss. She relies on lip reading, facial expression, and clear speech to understand her peers and teachers, which means she needs everyone around her to be mask free. Um, for hard of hearing kids, things that hearing people take for granted are very challenging, um, as you might imagine, like social pragmatics, correctly hearing, and then processing spoken language, and things like inference. Um, so when people wear face masks, the decibel level is lowered significantly, and lip reading and facial expression um, which are imperative to inferring meaning are eliminated. So um, let's just be really clear that a masking mandate for children at school means that as a community, we have decided that the perceived benefits of this intervention justify denying children like my daughter their federally mandated right to a fair and appropriate education that we are okay with breaking that law. I respect this community of educators so much. Um, and I have to believe that we're not okay with denying equity. There needs to be nuance in the conversation about blanket mandates like this because harm is being done. I'm heartbroken every day sending my kid to a sea of masked faces. For example, if we're going to defer to health regulatory boards when determining school policies, don't we have to demand that they're weighing the deleterious impacts these interventions are having on many children's mental, social, and emotional health? It's Thank you for listening and hopefully really hearing this side of the equation. Thank you, Amy. Next is Adrian Staub. Thank you. Um, it's hard to follow that um, very moving statement. Um, here we are again and at this point, it seems futile to recite the same litany um, that there's simply no compelling evidence that school mask mandates reduce the spread of COVID-19 here or anywhere else. That essentially all the so-called cases of COVID that we are identifying in the schools are asymptomatic or extremely mild. That masking of children is harmful to their education, their social development, their language development, their mental health that we are imposing masking first on those who are least affected by COVID and who are most harmed by wearing masks, that anyone who wants to wear a mask is of course free to do so, that COVID-19 will be circulating in the community forever, et cetera. It seems futile to recite this litany because two years in, it is clear that it is largely people's political and cultural identities that determine what they believe that faith in mandatory school masking as an effective intervention and faith that it is not harming children are not based on facts, 
These faiths may persist because of their signaling power or because it is very hard to come to grips with having been wrong and for these mistakes to have had such profound consequences for our children. So instead of talking about these facts yet again, I'll simply make a practical point. If Northampton becomes the school district that keeps mandating masks on kids when other districts aren't, people will start to leave. They will put their kids in private school if they can, they will move away, or they will simply not move here. The last speaker made this abundantly clear. More and more people are recognizing that this policy is both futile and damaging even if the authorities in Northampton are not recognizing this. Northampton is known for a lot of good things, including tolerance, a vibrant art scene, and a beautiful natural setting. But if this continues, it will rapidly become known for something else, something very bad. Thank you. Next is Mindy Haskins Rogers. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Mindy Haskins Rogers. I live in Florence. I have a child at Leeds. I'm grateful that you've reintroduced the mask mandate. Uh, we are a high risk family. And I agree that there has to be nuance in this conversation because in the first 10 days after Leeds went mask optional, we had 19 cases in the school. And my child's classroom has been, everybody in the classroom is considered a close contact now if one child has COVID because they are unmasked. My child isn't. And most, actually I'm understanding that most of the kids in the class are still wearing masks by choice. Um, however, because some of them are unmasked and those are the kids getting COVID, everybody's a close contact, which means that for several weeks since you've gone mask optional, my uh, partner and I are masking at home because our child's a co close contact and we want them to be able to be unmasked. We have to eat separately from our child. I mean, talk about emotional impact. We have to wear masks whenever we are in close proximity to our child or trying to cuddle our child. It is horrible, horrible for us. And I, we do it because we think that it's important that our family stay healthy and this is an airborne virus. Now, I appreciate the anecdotal evidence of more kids coming for speech therapy, but you know, there's been a lot of study about the impact of masks. There's been a lot of concern about it. And the comparison that's always made is that visually impaired children develop speech and language ability at exactly the same rate as children who, who are not visually impaired. There's been no evidence that actually masks are contributing to language delays. And I did also forward a study a while ago um, to the, um, to the board, the Arkansas school districts that studied 200 schools with varying levels of mask mandates and found that when they corrected for some of the errors in the early studies that showed no effect of mask mandates, there actually was a 23% reduction in transmission in schools that had full mask mandates. We know this is an airborne virus. This is, I mean, we knew logically based on what everything we've learned about the virus in the last two years that as soon as students took off their masks, they would start spreading this virus. Absolutely no health authorities have declared this endemic yet. It is still a very deadly disease. It is still unpredictable and we are still enduring these waves. We're not there yet. I hope we'll get there soon for my family's sake too. And for the sake of all the families who are struggling with the masking. Again, having worked in the district, I know that there are accommodations for students who need them. There is not some kind of maniacal oppression of children who have conditions or, or different abilities that require them to take off their masks or make it difficult for them to tolerate masks. There have always been accommodations and I think there's a lot of compassion in our schools. So I, I am grateful that you've reintroduced it until May 20th, I would urge you please to keep it until the end of the semester. Again, if this were, if it were scientifically proven that masks are, are not helpful, then your doctor's offices would be unmasked. Your hospitals would be unmasked. The medical professionals would be taking off their masks and seeing patients without masks. They're not because they know that that protects us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next is Ronnie Gold. Uh, hi, my name is Ronnie Gold. I have uh, two daughters at uh, Bridge Street School. And I'm here to speak tonight to ask that the decision around what should happen in schools regarding COVID safety uh, should be solely made by the health director and the health department as the community's confidence in the school committee, the SHAC and the superintendent's decisions have unfortunately been tainted due to the numerous changes in the decision-making process. I hope the school committee, mayor, superintendent, and health director find a way to move our school's COVID safety measures to the sole authority of the health department so our community can have confidence in how we will navigate COVID moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands. I'm just taking a quick look. All right. Seeing no further hands for public comment, we will move on with the agenda. Thank you everyone who came to speak this evening. Um, and next up, do we have any announcements from school committee members? I can't, hold on, I'm having a hard time seeing all of you. So let me, oh, sorry, member Agna. Thank you. As the school committee vice chair, I would like to make a statement for the record in the short period of time that many of us have been members of this body. We have faced several difficult issues, some of which are ongoing. None of us anticipated this would be an easy job and I, for one, am still very happy and honored to have it. I speak now to thank my school committee colleagues, the Northampton educators, the students and families who've been very supportive and respectful, even in disagreements. These moments are models for how a democratic with a small d community can and should operate. I am concerned that there have been also moments between us on the committee, between us and educators, and between us and students and families that have been less than respectful and have caused hurt for for some and anger for others. This all saddens me greatly, but it doesn't surprise me given the tenor of public discourse these days. As we move past one of the most contentious periods in the history of, school, of the school committee, I propose that my colleagues and I come together at a retreat to develop a clear mission statement for our work and norms for our meetings and our relationships. This process should be guided and facilitated by a professional. I will send out possible dates for this retreat as your vice chair. And as far as a process for healing for our whole community of stakeholders and citizens, I know that this will require time and a collective effort to make it happen. I volunteer for this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Agna. For that, are there other announcements from school committee members? Oh, Member Levy. Oh, hold on. Did you lose your co-hosting? Yeah, I think I didn't. I think I was never given co-hosting abilities. Right. Um, Can you please do that? Thanks. Thanks, Member Agna. I'm really excited for us to come together in a retreat. I just want to propose, given the direction we're moving as a district towards restorative practices and the incredible um, opportunity that uh, method brings for, for um, healing, uh, norm building, and uh, coming up with agreements moving forward that we that that our retreat be facilitated by somebody who um, is a restorative practices practitioner, and that that be the method that we pursue. I'd be happy to talk to you more offline about folks in the area who could help us with that. Thank you, Member Levy. Member Goldman. Thank you. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox, is your comment related to um, the retreat? Okay. Um, I just wanted to provide the committee with an update that I attended the ad hoc start time subcommittee that was comprised of individuals from the Amherst Pelham School District in our own district to continue to um, evaluate and consider the effect of start time on our community. 
um, and we're putting together a survey and um, we'll meet again soon to continue working on that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Member Goldman. Member Sarfi Cox. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement uh, about the Budger Community Board uh, at the Bridge Street School. Um, there is going to be uh, an event this weekend uh, to, to dedicate uh, the, the community board. Um, it, it, of course, the, um, the Bridge Street School um, sign went in um, last year, oh, time has so little meaning now. Um, and uh, uh, the community board came a little later. Many, many thanks to the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association um, and uh, uh, former school committee member, Ronnie Gold for uh, uh, incredible leadership uh, um, for uh, making these, uh, these things a reality. Um, the Budker Community Board uh, honors the legacy uh, of Jerry Budger, a great friend to, uh, to Bridge Street School uh, and a longtime uh, Ward 3 member. Uh, so the uh, Budker Board celebration is happening on Sunday, uh, the 15th at 4 p.m. Uh, in Lamprin Park, which is right next to Bridge Street School. Um, and there will be music and, uh, and festivities and I think some uh, light refreshments. Um, and I, I hope that you all can join. Thank you so much, Member Sarafi Cox. Member Stein. Yeah, I just wanted to um, quickly just express my solidarity and support for all of the trans and non-gender conforming members of our community, our staff, our faculty, and um, yeah, I, I just, I want them to feel supported by us and um, I'm hoping that they will call on us for help uh, and support um, as needed. Thank you. Thank you for that member's time. Member Davis. Hi, I just wanted to quickly um, make sure that uh, if you get a chance to swing by Northampton High School and see the beautiful mural that is, uh, I'm not quite sure if it's totally done, but in process um, and it's, uh, it was involvement with students and the teachers and um, it's a wonderful community and student effort and it's beautiful. Thank you for that. Any other announcements? There was a request from um, Member Goldman for an update um, or to sort of understand the budget process from here out. So um, the budget uh, sort of go through the rest of the budget schedule. Um, the budget will be submitted to the city council on this coming Monday, which is the 16th. Um, and then I will present the budget message, which is the sort of the front of the budget um, gets read at city council and that will be uh, a week from today. So that's Thursday the 19th. And then the city council holds budget hearings um, and will take uh, a vote potentially on June 2nd. Um, so that, that is the update on that. Any other updates or announcements? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to recommended actions. Uh, we have approval of minutes um, from school committee meeting March 10th and the special school committee meeting on March 17th and an acceptance of donations from Northampton Musical Booster Club donation of $12,385. So our motion. Sorry, Mayor, I, um, I did send down a message that the um, oh. March 17th minutes are not finished yet. And we'll- Oh, apologies. Okay, so we're moving the March 17th. So this is just the minutes from March 10th and the, uh, the donation, the Musical Booster Club donation. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Member Levy. Um, roll call, please. Annie, thank you. Member Gazy. Member Gazy. I don't see Member Gazy. Oh, there you Oh, hold on. Looks like Member Gazy needs to be made a co host again, perhaps. Okay. Let me find her. Can you unmute? 
There she is. Yeah, there you go. There I am now. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, Member Seraphie Cop. Yes, and afterwards, if we could just um, have a, a one sentence about what the donation was from the Northampton Musical Booster Club, that would be great. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. And Member Robbins. Yes. Um, Nick, are you here to give one sentence on the donation? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, the donation um, funds the, the stipends for the folks that worked on the musical production. Um, apparently that's traditionally how those stipends have been funded. Um, each year they make a donation to cover the eight different positions um, that are involved in, in producing the musical. So that's what that was for. Thank you. Yep. Okay, moving on. Um, unless there's objection, we have a few presentations tonight and people who are joining us, plus we have people who are here for certain items, um, members of the public who are here for certain items. So unless there's an objection from the committee, I would like to rearrange the schedule a little bit. I'm wondering if I could skip over for now reports and recommendations and um, move on to some new business items. I don't see an objection. Okay, can we start with um, the student representative report? Um, Lila, if you are here, I think you are. There you are. Hold on. Are you are you available to do that now, Lila? And then you can move yeah. on for evening. That sounds good. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, I just I guess I have a quick update about um what the student union's been up to in the past few weeks. Um. Yeah, so the first thing is that our elections are coming up soon for next year's, who will be next year's representatives. And we recently instituted ranked choice voting for our elections. So we'll have ranked choice voting um, for all of the student representatives on student union. So we're very excited about that. Hopefully we're able to do that with the rest of the school and that works out. Um, so, but yeah, everybody's super psyched about that. Um, and then another thing is that a math teacher reached out to us to talk to us about how to kind of have cell phones have less of a presence in the high school. So we'll be having a discussion with him about that soon um, and just kind of a preliminary learning about what it is. It's a program called Yonder, I believe, um, and it pretty much just like students get locked pouches to put their phones in throughout the day and then they're unlocked at the end of the day is my impression so we're going to learn more about that soon which is exciting um that kind of ties in with some of the mental health work we've been doing um as well as trying to get students to be more engaged in classrooms so we'll see where that goes if the student union ends up kind of supporting that specific idea or if we're gonna go in a different direction with that um and then the anti-racism subcommittee has been meeting with um, department heads to talk about our diversity supplement and how the implementation would that would, of that would look for different departments, um, what classes department heads think would fit under the supplement, um, and kind of figure out criteria for each department about kind of what would qualify. Um, and then standard-based grading, we talked about that at SAC, but we've pretty much just been talking to administration and also kind of having informal conversations with students and teachers and kind of just collecting general feedback about standard-based grading and trying to figure out how to make it work better for everybody. Um, and then the Lending Library Subcommittee has been trying to get sanitary products in all of the bathrooms. Um, and I believe that's moving forward um, yeah, so hopefully by next year, 
every bathroom in the high school will have um, sanitary products available for people to use for free. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lila. Any questions for Lila? All right. I don't see any. So thank you very, very. Oh, oh, oh that was a claps from Member Davis. Not a question. Um, thank you very, very much, Lila, for that. Um, so my, uh, so I know Julie Spencer Robinson is here and Principal Choquette are here um, for presentations. And um, I hope you will indulge me if I ask you to wait a little bit. Uh, there was a request that Public Health Director um, Meredith O'Leary join us today. Uh, and so, but she's only able to be, um, she has another engagement, so she can't be here for long. So unless there's an objection, um, I would like to move up item J to now. So this is vote on possible modification of, of policy EBCFA. This is the face mask and face covering um, policy. Um, so again, sorry, sorry to the two of you. And I know particularly Principal Shokat, you got bumped last time, but we will get there. Um, but if it's okay, I'd like to move this up so uh, Director O'Leary can join us. Thank you. Um, okay, so Member Stein and Member Levy, would you like to present this uh, and make a motion when you uh, are done, Member Stein? Um, sure, yeah, I'm actually, uh... I'm not sure, you know, why I was why I was particularly added for this item, but I'm happy to sort of, um, I think, give some perspective, which might clear maybe some of the confusion that I think was expressed in the public comments. Um, from my understanding of the process and and where we are, um, in late March when we voted to rescind the mask mandate, uh, one of the things we also did um, was vote to amend the masking policy. Um, in line with the recommendations made by um, Public Health Director O'Leary uh, that were requested by um, Dr. Provost. And at that meeting, uh, Kaya read through what those recommendations were. Um, there were two recommendations in that um, that made their way into the policy and they were recommended actions for when to trigger, uh, the word trigger is not used, but when universal masking should be reinstated. The first of those had to do with the new February 2022 CDC metrics hitting high. The second one was if um, SHAC um, determined that there was in-school transmission of COVID-19 and that there was an increased risk of infection. And my understanding, my perspective is that uh, the move to universal masking uh, was made based on this change to the policy, specifically the second uh, recommendation to return to universal masking, which was significant in school spread um, and a significant increase in the um, risk of disease. So um, I believe that that is, you know, was the intent of the committee in adopting those recommendations into our policy. Um, I don't know if they've been um, it hasn't been that long since we did that. So I don't even know if the subcommittee for policy has taken those recommendations and put them into uh, a different format or a different language, but that's what we voted to do at that meeting. So I think um, given that decision that the superintendent based on what he's hearing from Shaq was acting exactly in accordance with the policy um, and reinstating the mask mandate. Um, there's a couple difficulties uh, I think are questions about this that we didn't see then, or, you know, um, <laughs> this is an evolving process, right? But um, one is that um, at the time there was still a shack that committee members were attending. And since then there's, there is still a shack, but committee members are not attending. Um, and there's gonna be a new ad hoc committee, which we voted on last time as it relates to the uh, open meeting law um, complaints um, and then a recommendation from our attorney that we shouldn't make the shack an open meeting and we should do this other thing. So there's sort of an incongruity there. I don't know how we want to think about that or what the best way is to think about it. The other incongruity is that uh, or difficulty is that um, in sort of establishing these two triggers, 
we didn't establish a trigger to relax the reinstatement of the mask mandate. So nowhere in the amended policy does it state it would be like a two week period or Shaq would reassess. Re right? And what we're sort of saying is we're seeing in-school spread, but now we're putting masks back on. So we're likely to see um, a reduction in in-school transmission, but how do we know that <laughs> it's not just gonna spike back up uh, if we go for 10 days and you know we're no longer having a lot of cases and then we're not having a lot of cases because we're universally masked and then we take the mask off again. So um, I tried to figure out how to think about this myself. Um, and I looked back over some of the historical dashboards that the city of Northampton has put together um, across this period of time. So if you look at um, where we were on March 24th, when we made the move to unmask, we were at new CDC low. Um, it was a few weeks after that, that we became um, medium. And shortly after that, we saw our first cluster of a classroom in Northampton. And we've seen an accelerating number of cases to the point we reached last week since then every week going up, going up, going up. So the thing I draw from this is that maybe our threshold should be that medium trans, you know, that medium uh, transmission level. Um, I, I, this just based on this experience, right? So I don't know if instead of going to high, universal masking should trigger when we get to medium. Um, the new high is four times the height of the old high. So it's 200 cases per 100,000. Um, so I don't know if maybe we should switch it to when we get to medium, the mask go on and when we get back to low, the mask go off. But I think we need to find a way to include in the policy if we're gonna have this kind of a trigger, what's the trigger to relax the, um, the universal mask mandate as well. And it seems like if we made the decision when things were low to remove them and then it went to medium and we had to reinstate it, maybe that's, that's the space we need to be in. But again, this is just how I've been trying to think about it. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, Dean, I'm not sure uh, if this is helpful or, or what else you wanna add, but that's my perspective. Thank you, Member Levy. Thanks. I, um, I ask that this be on the agenda and I really appreciate Director O'Leary, your being here um, because I wanted to ask questions regarding what Member Stein was just saying. My concern um, based on the medical practitioners that I've been speaking with and the um, studies that I have been reading is that because of the lower testing rates in general that are we're not, that we're not detecting a number of the cases that are present in our community that would then bump the community level from me, low to medium to high or back down. And I actually wanted to ask Director O'Leary, and this was a conversation actually that we had when we made this decision about what are the metrics we should be using given that testing um, is not as prevalent in our community anymore or nationwide anymore. And we had talked about wastewater testing, uh, you know, there are different things that came up. So I, I would be really curious to hear Director O'Leary what your recommendation is for what we should be using. Do you think we should still be, I mean, I think you probably don't because we have a mask mandate back implemented that we should, I, 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 do you think we should still be using what we had decided upon, which was to be at high for two weeks, or is there a different metric that we should be using? That's my question to you. And the, the other statement that I would just like to make after listening to public comment is I, I very much appreciate all the different perspectives and how hard it is to go back to wearing masks. And my understanding is that get, given the nature of this pandemic, this is a little bit of what we are going to be facing is times when we will be able to take masks off and times when we need to put them back on. And so I, I'm with Member Stein. I would like to really have clarity and transparency for our community about what those metrics are that we use both to put the masks back on and also to take them off. And I also wonder, um, Director O'Leary, in answering the question, if you could also respond to whether we should be considering positive cases within our specific schools as a metric. Thank you. Thank you, Director O'Leary, for joining us. We really appreciate it. 
No, thank you for inviting me in. And those are great points and great questions. And I took some notes and I'm hoping that I'm able to answer them. But if I forget something, let's just bring it back. Um, you know, I just got off a Board of Health meeting to jump onto this meeting. And one thing that we've been discussing and have been discussing for two years is having a roadmap and how to move forward, right? Living with COVID because it's not going anywhere. And I, and I mentioned this because we've had this discussion um, almost every single one of our Board of Health meetings talking about setting metrics, but that is a moving target and they change and it's constantly evolving. So I'm not really um, a fan of um, setting or quantifying numbers, you know? And I think I've actually expressed that before in front of the school committee. What I'm really looking at when um, we're talking about, you know, masks on or, or off in schools is what's happening in the school community. Not so much the community at large, because we saw in our last surge that we had a spike in cases in uh, Northampton community, but still there were very few cases, even at our most peak point in our last <clears throat> surge, very few cases in our school community. And um, I don't believe we had any clusters and there was really no identifiable in school transmission. And that is when we had a very robust, robust, excuse me, contact tracing team, both on the school side and the health department side, both working together to make sure that we did all of the contact tracing. Now, the events that just happened were <clears throat> last week, the SHAC meeting met. There was a gradual increase of cases that had been happening over the course of four weeks, um, perhaps the beginning of April, I can say. And the city kind of mimicked too, just this gradual um, upward trend of cases, slower, much slower than what we saw in January, but we were seeing nonetheless cases go up. On Wednesday, the, there was a red flag and people were concerned. I wasn't on the shack meeting myself. I had a conflict. Um, however, my nurse was there and presented the Northampton data. Lisa Saffron was there, presented, presented school data. And the recommendation at that point was a mask advisory by the superintendent that went out Friday morning. Well, Friday afternoon, um, my nurse, public health nurse and I reviewed the data that was given to us by Lisa Saffron and we analyzed uh, and we did some analysis and we jumped from Wednesday to Friday afternoon um, by 117%. So right then and there, and we had clusters and we had known transmission in the school. With that prompted um, me to ask Superintendent Provost to have an emergency meeting of the SHAC so we could discuss this numbers and take action on that. Um, had we sent, set the metric, and I heard um, school committee member Stein say that you know one of the metrics we kind of did state back then was the county going into the red, right? I'm not sure that's ever going to happen because <clears throat> the CDC um, green, yellow, red map, we go to green to yellow really easy. That's just 200 cases. But going from yellow to red probably will never happen because it's all about death and the number of COVID cases, hospitalization cases, right? And, and, and our our, co our, our hospitalizations right now, we're at capacity, like 85% plus full in our hospital, but they're non-COVID cases because we have wonderful treatments now, right? If people get sick and within five days, you can get medications to help. So people aren't getting as hospitalized as frequently as they were. And we've got vaccines, so people aren't getting as sick as they were. Um, School Councilor Member Levy, do you have a question for me? Yeah, I actually wonder if you could um, go into some detail about the point you just made, because if, if we listen to the, a lot of the public comment, um, the, some of the points that are made is, is like, because we're not going to be in the red and because we're not having hospitalizations and we're not having deaths, because we have vaccines, because we have treatments, um, why do we need masks? Can you can you respond to that question? Sure. And I just want to disclose I was not on during um, public comment session, so I'm I I don't know what was said. 
So your question to me is, if we're not going in the red, then why are we going back to masks, right? Because we know masks work. We know that good filtration masks, when everybody is wearing them, reduces transmission. That has not changed no matter what um, through the course of two plus years. Masks work. What's changed is we thought cloth masks work and that now we have data and evidence saying that they don't work really well. But if all parties are wearing good infiltration <clears throat> masks, such as surgical or KN95 or, an, or N95 masks, they reduce transmission significantly. So we know that's a fact. <clears throat> so with that being said, and the status of um, of where we are with school cases, you know, the um, multiple of, I think all of our schools, I, I, I'm not positive on that, right? But we have cases and transmissions, known transmissions happening in their school, the percent of increase of cases in our schools. Um, we anecdotally are hearing that we have um, a significant amount of staff sick in our schools. We know that um, by talking to the state epidemiologists, other schools are feeling these same types of impacts right now and are talking about having to close down because of staff shortages. We wanna keep our schools open. So we also know that there are schools that have been closed down in Connecticut and Maine. Again, it's more disruptive to our students to have the schools closed down and we don't have remote learning options here or hybrid options for every, for you know for anything. Um, so masks are well known known source to, uh, excuse me, a well-known strategy to provide so source control, right? But we also have to think about other strategies too. This is not just one public health measure we're talking about. We're also talking about, you know, opening windows, you're using HEPA filters, spending more time outside. Tents are being delivered to the school this week. So we have increased accessibility of outdoor learning and eating opportunities. Testing, testing, testing. I can't say any more of uh, how, the importance of taking tests. If you're sick, stay home until you get your test results back. We're doing pool testing in the schools. They hand out um, uh, the at-home antigen tests. The health department has as many antigen tests as any person needs. Call me if you need them. Um, tests are, are pretty reliable. Um, if you uh, have been exposed and are symptomatic, stay home, get a PCR test. Um, and also vaccinations. These are the other prevention, uh, preventative measures that we must continue and increase in addition to masks. Now, when do we take masks off? <clears throat> I said to, um, during the SHAC meeting, let's reevaluate it at two weeks. Let's see where the data is. Um, I'm not saying this is a forever end of the school um, strategy, but I, I think it needs constant reevaluation. Thank you, Member Stein. Yeah, um, I just had two questions. Thank you for all that. That was really helpful. Um, and um, one is, I have a really hard time when I'm trying to look at that uh, new CDC metric with all of the different variables uh, and what moves from, from medium to high and all this, um, especially with the hospital case counts and like, how do you actually figure out those and where's that information? But in any case, I wonder what you think is unique about Hampshire that will keep us from getting to red with Franklin County in red, with Berkshire County in red, with Worcester County in red. Like, why do you feel so certain that we won't get to red here? Like, and I don't know if it's something about the metric and the amount of people, like, I don't really understand how that, how the new metric shape, like it's, it's more complex, I guess, with the hospitalizations and the deaths. Like, why are those counties red and like, you know, other counties in Massachusetts red, but we're not gonna get there? Hmm, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I feel like the, the red simply states number of COVID admissions to the hospitals. And I, I think something is missing there. It's not really, um, so, sorry, I, should, I, I shouldn't have said red too. I should have said like high. So like they're listed now as high, not okay, medium. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, my gotcha. apologies. 
Okay, so you um, so hypothesize why I think we won't get high. <laughs> um, well, um, we do have higher vaccination rates, booster rates than other counties. I think it was about a month ago I saw that Hampshire County had the highest booster rate in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so that could definitely be a factor. Um, I still feel like we have created a culture in Hampshire County um, that, you know, wear masks if you're comfortable, wear masks if you're in a public setting that you might be in close quarters. I think we do an exemplary job of promoting good public health practices and, you know, social distancing. There could be a, ver a variety of things, um, Council Member Stein, but um, it's, it's, that's my hypothesis. Um, for a fact, I can't speak to that, but off the top of my mind, that's what I'm thinking. Thanks. Um, and just one more question. Um, you know, one of the things we're, I think, potentially faced with tonight given the fact that we added in the previous recommendations to the masking policy is figuring out um, potentially some language uh, that would um, sort of do what you described, which is like, you know, the, the shack will meet again in whatever date, the 20th or, you know, whatever date the shack's gonna meet and talk about, look, evaluate the data. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering how to like phrase that, right? I mean, maybe it's as simple as saying, um, cause it's not a metric, right? It's sort of, the thing I liked about that second recommendation so much and why I think it was so useful um, in this moment was like, well, we're seeing clear indications of spread of disease, right? So I I'm wondering if there's, <laughs> maybe it's as simple as um, some language that might say, you know, uh, you know, given an assessment of, the data uh, in Northampton and the school population, we think the risk of in-school transmission is low, like, you know, is okay to, to remove, like, like, is there some version of that that you think would be? So we like to look at COVID case trends. I think that's the word that you were looking for, um, both, you know, community-wide and school-wide. COVID case trends, COVID-related uh, absences, evidence of continued in-school transmission, I think maybe that's the language you might be looking for. Thank you. Yes. Um, Member Stein, did you have a follow up to that or? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to uh, get that all down while I remember. I, no. don't, I don't have a follow up question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mute. Oh, no problem. Member Levy. Thanks. That was the direction I was going to go as well. I, I, I completely hear you that this is nuanced, that our, our targets are gonna change given all the different factors. And I also know that we've gotta be able to provide some transparency to our community. Um, and so I appreciate that language. I appreciate the focus on, on the potential for in-school transmission. And I think, Member Stein, I saw you writing, so hopefully you got that down. I. Director O'Leary, can you just help us understand when you meet in two weeks to reassess, what are you looking for and what would allow you to, to say, okay, we can take the masks back off? Um, I'm looking for obviously cases to continually be going down. Um, I, absences, you know, less absences. Um, no more clusters, um, evidence of no more in-school transmission. Um, it, I can't quantify it for you. That's really, really hard. Um, it's just all, all of the trends that, you know, we looked at when we made the recommendation to put the masks on. I think if I were to kind of enumerate, I would look back at, um, our, our dashboard and look at the graph on perhaps maybe when we lifted the um, mask mandate in the schools, can we get back to there? And so we lift it again, it's something to consider. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Thanks. Okay. That answer, or did I skirt around it? <laughs> um, I th it, both. I, there's a little bit of an answer there, and then I think I do think we as a committee need to land on something that we can put in our policy, but also communicate to our our um, community so that folks know and understand how we're making these decisions and what needs to be in place or not. And so it sounds like, but, but again, like if our rates are here and we say, well, we just, we need to see a decrease in rates and they decrease to here, is that okay? Or do they need a decrease to here? So again, I still feel a little unsure of what, what exactly we should be saying so that there's clarity. No, I totally understand the concept of people wanting on ramps and on and off ramps. I get the importance of that. Um, it's just uh, it, it's just not this one size fits all. And you know, um, if you do set this um, this metric for lack of better word, when, you know, we get to whatever it is, let's pull a number, X amount of cases, then we're going to take the masks off. I mean, is that hard and steady? Because in three weeks from now, we could be dealing with a different variant that just blows that metric out of the water. And I just, I, I'm afraid of, of quantifying it. So it's all about current data and, and what's available and looking at trends. Member uh, Davis. Uh, thank you. I, I, I mostly want to echo what um, Member Levy was, was saying because I think um, um, I think this, this is the correct way to put it, that maybe we could think of it as a both and that we could say right now, this is what we know. And this is the number, these are the numbers that we would be comfortable with if, if the numbers are going down, the clusters are X, the absences are such and such. Right now, knowing what we know, this is a comfortable, smart um, set of data that we could use for masks on or masks off and be transparent that we all know as grownups that there are variants and that this could change, but right now knowing what we know, because um, um, I could hear loud and clear the differences of opinion and the concerns um, as we all heard. And um, I would be very, I would be more satisfied if we had a number to start with and then PS, this might have to change because of the nature of COVID. Can I just counter that? Yeah, sure. Let me just pull an arbitrary number out and we use 15 or 20 as your number, the magic number. What if that 15 or 20 cases that we're dealing with in this one point of time are because of a large family gathering and has nothing to do with in-school transmission? You're gonna say that we're gonna put masks back on? I mean, you have to be very thoughtful and mindful when we're we're looking at data because I guess data I, can create a, a, a story that you want it to. I guess is what I'm saying. So, and it's my job to do a deep dive and get very granular with the data and look at what's happening. So that's all I'm trying to say. What you guys do with this information, I give obviously is up to you. But I just want you to see a different perspective of how I look at the data and what numbers actually mean. Can I just add one clarification onto that? Mm -hmm. sure. So so for me, uh, I guess I'm thinking if the data that, um, and I don't know if we can see this in what we come up with just because of the way people test now. I mean, I think that's really a significant thing mm -hmm. is that we don't see test results in the same way we were earlier in the pandemic because people just doing it in their bathroom and throwing it in the trash, you know? But if we see the absence, if we're looking, for example, at the absences at school, the cluster at a school, then whether or not, this is the way I see it, including myself as a teacher myself in a different district, if a family goes away and comes back 
and they're bringing COVID into the school, well, then there's COVID in the school, whether they got it at Disney World or from their classmate. And maybe you're, we're talking about two different things. So that's what I was just, are you talking about like grownups in a cluster, not students? And students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and and I, I, I'm not gonna pretend I know the answer to this question, so I'm gonna ask it and it, I'm not asking to be flippant whatsoever. Um, I, the process, what's, um, why not just trust in the Shack's recommendation? You guys put this committee, this advisory committee together that's full of professionals to help make these decisions. I, I don't know where this went awry and um, maybe that'll be helpful for me to understand. I don't know if a member Sarfi Cox is looking to answer that question, but I'm gonna call on her. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, Director O'Leary, that was uh, something that I've been thinking for much of many of these conversations. So um, I appreciate you asking it. And my answer would be, I, I, <laughs> I am glad that you have recommendations. And my question, my original question actually was um, really kind of what, why, I, di I don't quite understand why this is on our agenda this evening. Um, what are we being asked to, why are we being asked to revise this policy? And Director O'Leary, it's my understanding from hearing you speak that you're not recommending to us that we revise the policy. Um, it, was it was member Levy who had put it on to try and codify some particular metric, which member Levy with all of the love and respect in the world, we've been talking about this tension between specific metrics and, uh, and the, the nuance that comes at looking at granular data. Uh, we've been having the same conversation with director O'Leary for basically two years and, you know, on and off. And um, I, I, maybe it's because I have a, a public health professor uh, as a wife, but I really want to, uh, to, to take Director Leary's, um, you know, I think that looking at the way that I hear about my wife talking about public health data it is not cut and dry. So I, I, I support that for, for uh, um, Director O'Leary's uh, position. Um, so I guess the reason I raised my hand was I'm just trying to understand, like there's no motion on the floor. This is just a big conversation. And we have a bunch of other things on our agenda um, that frankly, uh, have more actionable items. So I, I guess I would like clarity on what it is that we're doing. Um, member Levy, would you like to, can you still not unmute? Can you, okay. I can, I was just hoping you would read, read my, I didn't know you called on me, but I was gonna say, I was trying to say that I'm happy to respond. So I think for me, it's hard to make a motion until it was hard for me to think about what the motion needed to be until hearing from Director O'Leary, um, which is why I didn't put a motion on the floor. The reason, and I apologize if this wasn't clear, the reason I asked for this to be on our agenda was that my reading of the policy, and maybe I'm misreading, um, my understanding is it, it doesn't say that the SHAC can, um, can advise the superintendent to make changes at any time to mask uh, mandates that we at the school committee need to e either what ha either we get into red or high for two weeks and then masks come back on or the school committee changes the policy. And so where we are now is we did something that I think wasn't quite in line with the policy. And I, I don't think we shouldn't have done it. I think there are two things happening here. One is I think we need to shift the recommend or the guidelines that are in the policy. The, the, and these are metrics and I get it that, that metrics are, it's not clear what metrics we need to, um, 
have, but we need to have something that guides when masks go on. And we need to have something that says when they're going to come back off. And that's not in the policy either. Um, and the other thing that I think we need is I think we need some kind of a statement that says also, if we're not meeting for a month and there and there's something that happens in the community that the shack or director O'Leary and the superintendent have the authority to to make changes and that we do not as a school committee need to come together and make that and and that was that's not a part of our policy either so i'm getting closer to making a motion uh maybe member stein is ready to make a motion that's where that's why i put this on uh, and if you read it differently i'm really open to it to that because maybe we don't need to have this conversation maybe it's all in there and i'm just not seeing it also I got a kitten in case anybody wants to see it. I'm going to hold it up. Yes. Yes to the kitten. Um, in the meantime, uh, Member Robbins. So I, I also wonder why um, we're having this conversation. And I wonder if it's something that should actually go back to having a discussion with rules and policy about. But it does read to me clearly that um, about what we're going to do. I definitely appreciate Director O'Leary's um, presenting to us tonight. I think that transparency and that discussion about how those decisions are made are really important and very helpful. And I, I guess I feel like um, as we go through this pandemic or the follow-up to it or those other pieces, it would be wonderful to have Director O'Leary be able to come meet with us on that regular basis and be able to share, this is how, um, this is how things are now, and this is how I've made the decision. And I am actually quite comfortable with what the decision, how the decision was made this last week. And I think it was a good one. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I agree that it was, there's not clarity in our policy to cover that when it happened. And maybe we do need to build that in, but I'm not sure the whole school community uh, committee needs to be part of that discussion at this point until it comes back, unless somebody has a good motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me go. Uh, can I go to member Sophie Cox and then I'll go back to you, member Stein. Um, thank you. I, <clears throat> I read the policy more closely and there is a sentence that says uh, the Northampton public schools will follow the current DESE guidance unless the superintendent's health advisory committee and or the city's health department decide to follow modified guidance and provide an explanation to the NPS community. And from what I understand of the timeline that both the superintendent laid out in writing and that Director O'Leary laid out in more detail this evening, that is what happened. The shack met and decided on a revised set of recommendations that the superintendent implemented. Um, so I do think that this situation is covered in the current policy. And if there are specific recommendations that you would make to clarify it, I would love to see those. And I think that they should be brought to the rules and policy committee at its next meeting, which is in like a week and a half or something like that. So, um, so I would make a motion to refer this, uh, this, uh, this item to the rules and policy subcommittee um, and to ask uh, member Levy to work with the superintendent, perhaps to, to come with specific recommendations for changes. Okay, that there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that is similar to the motion I was gonna make, but can I offer a bit of clarity now? So they don't have to come back to superintendent. Although, Mike, sorry, <laughs> Member Stein, your, your hands up. Yeah, sorry. I've been in the queue here. Um, sorry, sorry. Just seconding, um, just seconding. <laughs> well, I just wanted to see that one of the things that I think isn't captured yet in our policy is in my recollection and when I looked back at the, the last meeting or the meeting from the 24th, one of the things Kaya did was make a motion which was passed with our vote to repeal to add in all of the recommended language that Director O'Leary had provided to us. And included in that was the following. Um, recommended thresholds for universal masking requirements in school. Okay, the first one is CDC community level in Hampshire County elevates to high for two or more weeks 
Member Stein, can I clarify what, it, instead of reading everything that that is, can I just clarify, are you saying that the current version of the policy is not what we voted on? That is a clerical error and should absolutely be rectified, but does not need another vote of the school committee. And so- Right, but I, the issue I'm trying to point out is that yeah. the, the, the relevant sentence here, which I think authorized the superintendent to act as he did, is the following. Shack determines based on assessment of evidence of increased school COVID transmission that there is an increased risk of disease. The problem I'm pointing out now is that since this is our policy, we don't have an off ramp. So to have the- we, So bring, bring specific yeah. recommendations yeah. to the subcommittee and that will be beautiful and wonderful and, but and they, a robust discussion. But they're gonna meet in two weeks. We don't have a policy to cover that. We have a policy that to cover the on ramp, not the off ramp. They're going to have a conversation in two weeks about an off ramp. Okay, I don't know what which off and on we're talking about. The, the, the masks, masks coming the masks off. Back yeah. off. Yes. So we don't yes. have a policy that states this, and we're having this work being done that is not in accordance with the policy. So that I think you know, but we're, yeah. So I, I think that you know, for I think it. I didn't ask for this to be on the agenda. Um, I'm not quite sure how I would have gone about doing it, but you know, we referred updates that we made collectively to, to the Paul about this policy two months ago to the committee. Those haven't been done yet either. Things are moving faster than the policy can, committee can work because there are so many policies that they're working on and so little time. So I think that I, I'm not saying we need to make a change tonight, but I, I, I think we're headed to a place where we're not acting in accordance with whatever our policy is. And, and, and beyond that though, like the reason why the school committee has to be the ones that authorize these things and set policies for all these things is because that is our role. And we went through this endlessly and we just lived through, you know, six weeks ago, this, because these are political decisions at the end of the day, right? We went through an intense lobbying campaign. We had one earlier this evening. These are not, and there's no simple metric that will set us free as uh, Director O'Leary has pointed out. So I will again say that that is why we are having these conversations. Um, I think there's better ways to have them. And I think there's effective ways to modify policy and our normal wheels around policies can't keep up with COVID. But um, that, that's why we're having these conversations. Um, thanks. Member Levy, did you have something else to add? Not really. Uh, I guess I, the clarity that I would add to what I would hope the Rules and Policy Committee would, would bring back to us, similar to what Member Stein was saying, was that there would be clarity around when masks are taken back off. And uh, I think if it's, if it's simply up to the shack and that recommendation, then maybe that doesn't need to be in there either. Maybe it's just like a, a nuanced little half sentence that gets added. Um, but I'm happy to have this go to the rules and policy subcommittee. Thanks. And any of that information that can be provided to the subcommittee chair in writing would be especially useful. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Can I ask for um, someone to reiterate the motion, please? My motion was to refer um, policy EBCFA face masks and face coverings to the rules and policy subcommittee to clarify uh, the concerns uh, raised this evening that will be provided to the subcommittee chair in writing. Thank you. Uh, Member Levy, you looked a little confused. I know I, I said it differently before, but I think provided more clarity. Okay, if there's no further discussion, roll call, please, Annie. Member Serafikoff. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. 
Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. And Member Gazy. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Director O'Leary. We're deeply grateful for you joining us this evening. We appreciate it. She can't hear all. Do you want to? I was just saying, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Have a good evening. Bye. Um, okay. So I would like to move now to D, the equity audit, audit process um, with Principal Choquette, who uh, waited patiently at the last meeting and um, has waited patiently at this meeting. And so this, um, there is no vote for this. This is a presentation by Principal Choquette. Welcome, Principal Choquette. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I just, I, I just want to say off that, I want to be clear that I don't come claiming to be an expert in equity audits and also um, that I'm not here to um, share Northampton's equity audit process, which I did see a post tonight on Facebook that that's what was happening. This is just me sharing information about um, equity audits and my experience in um, conducting an equity audit. So I don't want people to think that I'm presenting um, your process for an equity audit um, as I had heard rumblings of that. So, um, but it is my understanding that um, there are folks talking about um, an equity audit at um, the high school. And so I was asked to come share um, what I know about equity audits and a little bit about my experience in conducting an equity audit. Um, but before I share um, my particular experience in doing that, um, I think it's important just to make sure that everyone here and who's listening um, understands what an equity audit is. Um, in the broad sense, um, an equity audit is using evidence to inform decisions about improving teaching and learning. Um, it helps to identify places to improve with the goal of providing optimal teaching and learning for all students. An equity audit should be part of a broader plan and is best conducted in ways that surface perspectives from a wide range of stakeholders, including students and families. Um, I believe you received a resource I shared with you from Unify High School. Um, it's um, just a resource that had some really great information about equity audits, but I really liked the way they described um, an equity audit. So I'm just going to share that with you. Um, they describe it as a means to identify, assess, and tackle issues of inequity in school practice and policies and to assure that every student succeeds regardless of household income, race, gender, or zip code. And so equity audits really should have a purpose. In other words, you know, what, what is the goal of the equity audit? If Northampton wants to conduct an equity audit at the high school, what is the purpose? What is the goal of that equity audit? Um, it requires a lot of data collection. And it's really important that that data collection includes historical context and trends um, that the district or a particular school have seen over a period of time. Um, they should focus on three broad areas, which I believe is also in that document I shared, um, teacher quality, educational programs, and student achievement. And, there, and I can't stress this next part enough, there absolutely needs to be protocols around data analysis, um, around um, interviews, if whether it's with individual um, people or focus groups, and it really is important to have those protocols to ensure that there is no bias. They are not quick. So my hope is that if we're thinking of an equity audit, that we're not thinking of trying to do something by June 27th, because um, I, I would not recommend that. It is a long process and it does take a lot of time, um, but they can open our eyes to inequities and barriers that are getting in the way of all students being successful and having equal access and opportunities um, to learn. And so that's a little bit about equity audits. And um, so I just wanna share with you my experience and kind of the context of the equity, equity audit um, that I conducted. So um, mine, I believe I did in the fall of 2017 and it was part of my doctoral program. And um, it was done in a city just south of Boston. And I can't share the name of the district because it wasn't a public audit. Um, but the purpose of, our audit um, that we had to do was to look um, across four elementary schools in this district 
um, at two programs that they had and to look to see if uh, there were any inequities between these two pro programs. And the two programs were um, two pathways that the elementary students had to take starting in first grade, either a pathway of French immersion or a pathway of um, English STEM innovation. And um, some of the things that we were looking at where we looked at the representation of race and disability in each of those programs, equity gap identification in each of those programs, parent and community engagement um, between the two programs and stru structural and cultural barriers in each of those programs. And through our data collection and analysis, um, using data from observations, interviews, focus groups, we then created an action plan uh, for the district. Um, earlier, I had talked about the importance of having purpose and goals of an equity audit. Um, it's also really important to have, um, you know, kind of like guiding questions as you go through this process. And so the guiding, just to share, um, so you have some context and an example of what that might be for our audit, our guiding question were, how does an affluent suburban community adapt to changing racial demographics? Is there a relationship between the racial representation in the French Immersion Program and the English STEM Innovation Program? Does enrollment in the French Immersion Program impact the identification of and access to disability services for students in need? And are there equitable allocations of faculty support available to provide those services? And after conducting um, the equity audit, you know, um, or after conducting our, our observations, our interviews um, over the course of several visits. Um, and this was done um, a little bit quicker because it was part of a class. So we had a semester to do this. Um, we shared our report with the, the superintendent after, um, and I think you should have received the protocol that we used for the data analysis. Um, I did send that to be part of the packet, but we used a data analysis protocol um, to do all that and created our report that we shared with the superintendent. Um, and again, I'm gonna say this again, it is so important to use protocols because it's very easy um, to start analyzing data um, and information that you collect and it's very easy for bias to come in, our personal opinions to come in. Um, so it's extremely important to use protocols when doing this analysis of, of the data. Um, I also would recommend during the interview process of recording people, but you do need permission to do that. Um, and um, typically there's a script or a form um, that you can use for that. And then just finally, um, I just want to say um, it, it really was a great experience to be able to have conducted one. It was a lot of work um, and a lot of time, um, but it can be powerful and it should not be done quickly. And like I said before, um, it really needs to have a purpose or needs to be a goal to it. Um, and the intention should be to ensure that either schools and districts are providing equal access and opportunity for all students to succeed. Um, stakeholders must be willing to see and accept the barriers causing inequities and be committed to removing those barriers in order for all students to achieve ex educational excellence. And that might mean we have to be willing to accept that maybe we were wrong about the things that we thought about something, um, which um, through data and observations and everything that you collect um, will help you through that. And so that's just a little bit about my experience in conducting one and what I know about them. As I said in the beginning, this is not your process. I um, was just invited here to come share the process that I went through. So thank you. And um, thank you. if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. I also have lots of documents if people are interested. I have like our observation protocol, our interview protocol. Um, there's great examples out there of questions um, that should be asked um, or can be asked um, around um, an equity audit and they can be tailored to individual schools or whole districts just depending on, again, what that purpose is, what the goal is of an equity audit. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Are there um, some questions? Or just, oh, Member Stein? Uh, hi, Principal Shaket. Thanks so much for Thanks. presenting um, and being here and teaching us about your experience in, in doing this work. Um, I guess uh, my question really is, and it is really like, you know, if the, if the district wanted to do an equity audit or a school wanted to do an equity audit, like what are some of the things you would recommend they either think about or some of the actions they take 
in order to begin that planning process or, or how, how should they think about approaching it? Sure. So, um, well, I would recommend not one person doing it by themselves, that there certainly um, should be a team because <laughs> um, it is a lot. And that team should be representative of, um, you know, I would say our, our students, our community, um, our faculty, you really want a nice representation of um, who, who we are in Northampton. Um, and then the next thing is, I, the first thing I, I guess people should have is, so what is the purpose? What is our purpose of doing an equity audit? Um, are we going in for a specific reason. So like when we did ours, we knew we were looking at inequities between two pathways that students could take in, in the elementary schools in this, this specific um, community. And, um, you know, were there inequities? And if so, what were those inequities? Um, and there were many between, um, between the French immersion program and the students who stayed in the English um, STEM innovation program. And so um, that purpose, like, I, you know, and whether or not that's something you all come up with as a school committee, if it's something, um, you know, uh, equity audit committee works with you on, but there definitely needs to be a purpose in the goal. What is the goal? Why are we conducting this equity audit? And the hope is because we want to make sure that we are creating opportunities to learn for all students that, and all students have equal access. Um, but it might be that you're looking at one school and, and, you know, without going into, you know, what things that we've been talking about in this district, you might be looking at a program. Um, but um, so I would start with what it, what is the purpose? What is our goal? What do we want out of an equity audit? Um, and making sure we have a, a committee or a group of people that is really representative um, of our community. And that does include students and families and community members as well. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments for Principal Chiquette? I don't see any. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. We really very much appreciate it. Thank you. You know where to find me. And it is only 8.15 and I know I was on the agenda for after nine o'clock, so I'm very grateful to <laughs> have been on earlier. So thank you very much and thank you for having me. Thank you, bye. Bye. Okay, so next let's go to our other presentation, which is on school choice in the Northampton Public Schools. And I welcome Dr. Spencer Robinson, who's joining us this evening. Hello. Hey, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, you all have been on the receiving end of lots of information. I wonder if there's any room in your brains left for more. <laughs> Um, I have a slide, uh, I have some slides that um, I think are going to be shared. Yeah, are, are you going to share them or? I think Ms. Thompson was. Oh, okay. You're the co-host now. Um, Annie, are you doing it or would you like Dr. Spencer Robinson to do it? Well, I'm happy to do it, but um, Julie can, it might be better if Julie does do it because she can control it a little better. Does that work for you, Julie? Yeah, let me um, get it and then see if I can share. So just give me one sec. Maybe you're creating some space in your brains now. Okay. Is that working? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, hello, my name is uh, Julie Spencer Robinson. I worked in the district from 1992 to 2019, and I recently completed my dissertation study of Northampton Public School parents. So you're getting two doctoral studies in a row here. Um, it is titled "Active Choice or Default Decision." Uh, when families who reside in a competitive school choice environment enroll children in their district, district schools. Um, thank you for inviting me to share my findings with you. Hang on, I'm gonna hit this, oops. We're on the next slide now, good. 
Okay, so um, I became, I first became interested in school choice as a teacher at JFK Middle School. In the early 2000s, I noticed the demographics of my classroom changing with more and more students who didn't live in Northampton. It also seemed like there was an increasing number of city families who were not choosing the district schools. And there was definitely growing tension in the community related to the issue of charter schools. In October of 2010, the Daily Hampshire Gazette asked me to be part of a focus group to discuss the film Waiting for Superman, which was critical of district school systems and promoted charter schools as an alternative. I knew by then that I really wanted to learn more about the issue of school choice and how it was impacting the district in which I lived and worked. So I enrolled in the Educational Policy Research and Administration doctoral program at UMass Amherst. And here is some of what I learned. Public school choice became a meaningful policy tool in the 1990s when legislators in Massachusetts and throughout the nation significantly expanded families' access to it, primarily in the forms of charter schools and interdistrict choice programs. That's where a family lives in one district but enrolls their child in another. School choice policy rests on two assumptions. That, um, that it will promote equity of opportunity by allowing any student the freedom to exit an underperforming school for a better performing one. And um, that district schools exposed to competition would be more responsive to students and families and ultimately more effective. Critics expressed concern that it would exacerbate student sorting on the basis of race, socioeconomic background and ability. There's been a great deal of research that explores the impact of public school choice on the students and families who leave their assigned districts and uh, on those who are left behind, but much less is known about the school enrollment decisions of families who attend their local public schools. And that was the focus of my study. It was guided by these questions. Did families intentionally choose to live in Northampton so that their children could attend the district schools. There's, there's a lot of uh, anecdot anecdotal information about that, but not really any more formal data. Um, at the time of student enrollment, what school characteristics appealed to in-district parents? Were they aware of ed other educational options for their children? Did they consider them and why? Where did they get their information about schools? Were there parents who would have liked to exit the district but couldn't? What barriers did they face? Would they still choose to leave the district schools if they could? And for each of these questions, were there differences related to parents' race, socioeconomic background, or education level? I chose Northampton as a study site because I was rooted in the community and had firsthand longitudinal experience witnessing the impact of school choice as both an educator and a parent. It is a small district located in a competitive educational environment where six schools served about 2,400 students. Before the expansion of public school choice, 12% of school-aged children left the district for 21 schools. At the time of my study, 26% of students left for 34 different schools. 11 of these were inter-district public schools and seven were charter schools. Northampton was both a top sending district in the state and a top receiving district of students through public school choice and there was a net financial loss to the district of more than $2 million as a result of this student transfer. The first stage of my study was quantitative, a four minute survey of in-district parents about their school enrollment decisions. And if you took my survey, thank you. I collected 304 completed surveys representing about 25% of Northampton families, much higher than my target of 10%. However, the pandemic meant that I couldn't administer the survey in person at school-based events and had to rely primarily on building principals sending it out electronically at a time when parents were inundated with email communications. This skewed my data collection toward respondents who were wealthy, well-educated, and older, which has implications for my findings. The race and ethnicity of survey participants was re representative of the city's demographics, but the sample wasn't large enough for me to draw conclusions about any related patterns in these parents' decision-making processes. An important area for further research is to learn more about the school enrollment decisions of parents of color, those who are not as well-resourced, and those with less formal education. The second stage of my study was qualitative, where I interviewed a subset of my survey population. 
over 100 people volunteered to be interviewed, which I think speaks to the community's interest in the issue of school choice. Six participants were randomly selected from each of these three groups. Those who identified as Asian American, Black, Hispanic or Latino, biracial or mixed race, those reporting household incomes of less than $75,000, and those who identified as white and reporting household incomes of $75,000 and above. Their enrollment experience spanned a period of 17 years, and the majority enrolled their children when they were in preschool or kindergarten, and they were given pseudonyms. With my first research question, I wanted to know the extent to which the district schools factored into people's decisions to live in Northampton. On the first survey, 70, I'm sorry, on the survey, 76% of respondents reported that the public schools were important or very important in their decision to live in Northampton. Sariona said that we made a decision as to where we would live, knowing that we were planning to have children. And we thought about whether or not we wanted to continue living in Northampton as we planned to have a family. And then we decided to stay in Northampton and also try to identify which elementary school we would want our kids to go to and try to find a home in that zone. In exploring why parents decided to enroll their children in the city's schools, an unexpected theme emerged during my interviews, and that was participants' ideological support for public education, which factored into their decision. Mary said, I think a country should provide a public school education to all of its citizens, and it would be a little bit hypocritical for me to value that as a personal belief and then send my child off to a private school. Miriam stated, if more families with means were sticking with public schools, public schools would be better. Education should be the great equalizer. It's not because there are other more systemic problems, right? But it could be this force of equalization. My second research question explored the specific school characteristics that mattered to parents at the time of student enrollment. On the survey, parents were asked for their opinions about 14 characteristics of the Northampton Public Schools represented by the blue bars. Then they were asked whether each of those 14 characteristics mattered to their enrollment decision represented by the orange bars. Academic reputation and teacher quality were viewed most favorably by parents, and they were also the two most important factors in parents' enrollment decisions. School location, LGBTQ acceptance, and student safety were also viewed positively by parents and were important enrollment factors. In the interviews, neighborhood location and student diversity were the characteristics named most frequently by participants as reasons for deciding to enroll their children. Racial and ethnic diversity was prioritized, but parents also valued diversity in students' socioeconomic backgrounds languages spoken at home, and learning abilities. Elisa spoke to location. We love the idea of a neighborhood school. We like that we could walk into it. It just felt like a nice natural transition from being home to like going into a bigger world. And Emily addressed diversity. I was a little bit disappointed when I saw the racial and ethnic makeup of the public schools here. But then I quickly realized that diversity is more than just race and ethnicity. And quite frankly, there's a lot of kids at her school who aren't white, which I was like, oh, this is actually nice. Community was a top characteristic too. And it was described both as the public schools being a microcosm of the larger community and also the schools fostering a sense of community. Rachel talked about the microcosm aspect. My value system is to say, yeah, this is what the world looks like. You have a student in your class who's in a wheelchair. You have several students in your class who are learning English now. You have several students in your class who are like two grade levels above you. You have several students in your class who may need to repeat kindergarten. This is what the world is like. The best for you is to grow up seeing as much of a slice of humanity as I can provide for you in this very like self-selected suburb that we live in. Access to special education services was another characteristic that emerged as significant in the interviews, pulling six of the 18 parents into the district. While several described how they successfully advocated for their child's placement at a preferred school within the district, none of them felt like they had a feasible alternative outside of it. Sarah described her experience. We wanted him to go to a private preschool actually, but it wasn't happening because he was diagnosed with autism and the private preschool could not, did not have the capacity to take care of him or his needs at all. 
So we shifted from the beautiful idea of the outdoor nature preschool to good old fashioned public preschool, just like we went through with all the supports that he needed. This chart shows how parents rated the significance of each characteristic in their decision to enroll their children in the Northampton Public Schools. The blue bars represent the 304 survey participants and the orange bars represent the subset of 18 interview participants. It's interesting to observe the contrast. And of course, it's important to remember that there were two different types of data collection tools. I wanted to know more about parents' awareness of alternatives to the district schools at the time of enrollment, whether they considered them, and if they did, what were their sources of information? The survey revealed that 95% were aware of their educational options and 58% considered them, lending support to the idea that many of these parents were actively choosing the district schools. In the interviews, all 18 were aware they had options and 12 considered them. Parents reported a variety of reasons why, and no single clear theme emerged from them. Friends and neighbors were the top sources of information during the school enrollment decision-making process for all survey respondents. And for those who considered their options, parents of their child's friends and school visits were also important sources. My third research question explored potential obstacles to families exit from the district. On the survey, respondents were asked if several items mattered in their decision to enroll their child in the Northampton Public Schools. 41% said they didn't want to or couldn't pay for private school. 22% couldn't homeschool their child. 15% couldn't drive their child to an out of district school. And 9% said their child's charter school lottery number wasn't chosen. Education as a factor keeping families in the district. In summary, the Northampton Public Schools were an important factor in participants' decisions to live in the district. Almost all of the parents were aware that they had educational options at the time of their child's school enrollment, and the majority of parents explored these alternatives during their decision-making processes. In this district, located in a competitive choice environment, these parents can and should be considered as actively exercising school choice. District leaders should therefore seek to systematically understand why families choose the schools and what they want from their child's edu children's education. This information could be used to inform the development of district policies, curricula, and programs. District schools are closely linked to people's decision to live in Northampton. Civic leaders should elevate the public schools in any campaign to attract permanent residents. Welcoming messages at points of entry to the city, whether they are physical or virtual, could include information about the schools. Their convenient neighborhood locations, teacher quality, and student diversity should be featured because these were identified as important characteristics by many participants. The local chamber of commerce should be briefed annually about the school's educational missions, programs, and accomplishments, since a healthy local economy is partly dependent upon people deciding to take a permanent residence in a city or town. District leaders should be alert to the possibility that residence choice can sort families and students in the same ways that school choice can and provide remedies when that occurs. They should also be attentive to the experiences of parents who have children with special needs since they generally lack viable educational alternatives to the district schools. Parents' district school enrollment is based on meaningful academic and social emotional characteristics and rooted in their ideological support for public education as a valuable common good. District leaders should cultivate strong partnerships with parent advocates in the interest of maintaining high quality, innovative schools with a continuous alignment between families and administrators regarding mission and programs. They should also recognize that parents are treating district schools as part of the local educational marketplace and respond by actively promoting them. Positive messaging should reach parents in their neighborhoods and their social and professional circles. School staff should also be prepared so that family visits are a beneficial experience. Districts can play an important role in teaching parents about the school enrollment process and making them aware of the options available to them. This counteract 
any sort student sorting effects of school choice by making sure that all families have access to information about their educational possibilities. Thank you again for this opportunity to share the findings of my research with you and for giving consideration to my recommendations. Thank you so much so for welcome. sharing that with us. Of course. Are there questions or comments for Julie in addition to thanks? <laughs> Member Levy. You you can unmute? Okay. Um, Member Levy needs to, you made a co-host again perhaps? Thanks, sorry, my internet kicked me out for a second there. Um, thank you so, so much for the presentation. It's hugely informative and I think can really, really help us as we are thinking about some of our work ahead as a, as a committee and as a district. I'm curious, um, you were looking at the uh, choices that families had in terms of school choice, charter schools, other districts. Did you uh, uncover reasons why families were choosing private schools over over the, the district public schools? Or did that come up? Were the reasons, if so, were the reasons any different uh, from, from what you've presented to us? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, that wasn't part of my study. I was, um, a, there, there's a lot of information about why families leave the districts to which they're geographically assigned for private schools, for charter schools, homeschooling. Um, and there isn't much, there's almost no information about the, the decisions made by in-district families. So that was the focus of my study. I did two other studies in the district. One was a case study where I, that was when I was, um, what the first study I did in the district was looking really seeking to understand the trends and um, I'm happy to share that information with you for sure. Um, and I will share my, if you want, I'll share my dissertation and I have a, a lot more information about Northampton and how it's been impacted by choice. One of my favorite tables shows um, the, how the choices made by families, I've got two actually, that have changed over time and the private schools that they used to send um, their children to and the private schools that they send their children now. And certainly charter schools um, enrollment have taken the, have supplanted some of the private school enrollment. Like that's in my dissertation as well, which I'm happy to share with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Member Stein. Yeah, I wanna echo uh, Member Levy's uh, appreciation for it. It was really, um, insightful and um, useful for thinking about the work that the district needs to do. And I was struck by, um, I don't know if it was the 75, the, the high number of folks who had an ideological commitment to public education. And it resonated with me because that's something that I've encountered, but I just didn't assume it was that large. Um, and so that was sort of really nice um, from my perspective to hear. Um, because, you know, it is like one of the few remaining large public institutions that haven't been privatized, despite the sort of charter incursions. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, I just, it was really helpful and I just really appreciate it. Um, I, and this is not part of your study, but uh, I've tried to keep up a little bit with some of the funding changes and the sort of talk and recently about reimbursement rates um, regarding school choice. I'm wondering if you have, you know, just sort of any sort of thoughts about what you've seen um, at the state level and, you know, how it might impact us here or how you're thinking about it. I, I, I'm, I'm not thinking about it too much because, uh, you know, a lot, lot is, so much is undecided. There's just not, not a lot of information. Um, I'll come back to that in a sec. I wanted, I was very surprised um, by the ideological support for the public schools. It, my um, interviews were, my interview questions were open-ended. Um, I was asking parents to tell me about their school enrollment, uh, about the time that they enrolled their child in school. It was, it was very, you know, that it was, they were sharing that story. And um, I was surprised at how that unprompted, completely unprompted by me that that came up. Um, in the, that number of interviews. And the characteristics that I used as my survey and that I also used um, to quantify my 
qualitative responses. Um, those came from the literature and also from school ratings websites, right? But ideological support for public schools wasn't one of them, and so that was really neat. Um, in terms of the, just like the, you know, uh, there's a lot of debate about um, reimbursement rates for, um, Part of my dissertation too is the how the, your predecessors in the school committee ultimately came uh, to, to decide to participate in school of choice. And it was yes, to make up some lost revenue to charter schools, but it was also because the school committee members felt like if these, um, the, that people wanted to come to the Northampton public schools, we should give families that, that opportunity. Um, the, the, you know, different states have different formulas for reimbursing charter school tuition or not. In some states, um, charter schools have their own line item in the state budget, and so they're not felt. Um, it, you know, the charter school uh, enrollment isn't felt at the district level. In our district, that was a different, another study I did. I wanted to learn more about why the district responded the way that it did to school choice. Um, and I learned that the, um, the mayor at the time kept the costs of charter school tuition on the city side of the budget and not on the school district side of the budget. So school committee members weren't always completely aware of what those costs were. They certainly didn't have to make up the money for the students who had left out of their own budget. And so that was, you know, the mayor was highly praised for doing that. Um, but also it might have insulated the school committee members a little bit from that. And then my last thought, the idea of, um, you know, that, that the, when students enroll in charter schools, they don't just get the money from the state, which is a tax, which the interdistrict public school choice students do. They also get the local share of funding from the districts, right? So it, it's a higher cost for sure. The, the idea behind that, there were two, you know, one was the competition idea um, that if it hurts districts financially, they, uh, parents want what's not being offered in a district and their financial costs to the districts for not offering those programs, they'll step up and do that. And in fact, at the high school, you know, many years ago, not long after PVPA was um, found, you know, when it was really having a big impact on our district a lot of money was put into the uh, performing arts programs at the high school. And we, my son reaped the benefits of that, you know, for sure. Um, but the, um, the, it, it's the funding, it, it's complicated, you know, for sure. Um, because there are, there, uh, it, you know, it also seems like it, the other justification for why more money goes to charter schools is because they don't have the physical infrastructure that traditional public schools have that the states have invested in, you know, through all their funding sources. So that's their justification. But it's kind of, it's complicated. It's, everybody has different positions on it and I'm still not sure how I feel. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a long answer. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Member Miller. Um, again, I just want to echo the gratitude for this great presentation is so helpful and interesting and important to all of us. Um, I guess I had just one quick question, which is, I didn't know if you noticed at all, whether there was any data that told you at what point in kids education were they leaving? Like, did we get a sense of they're leaving in first grade, they're leaving in eighth grade, you know, what, did you learn anything about that? That, that wasn't part of my study either. Um, and I absolutely think that the district should track that. Um, I would also advocate for every time a student is enrolled that the, um, just a few questions are asked the families who are enrolling the children why they're being enrolled. And we, we absolutely ought to track when uh, families are leaving and why they're, fam why they're leaving. There should be a, a short exit survey as well, I think would be really helpful. Absolutely agree. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Member Goldman. Um, yes, thank you again, um, Dr. Spencer Robinson for your presentation and for your work. Really appreciate you putting so much effort into our district schools, understanding them better. Um, at the beginning, you were talking about how the balance works out that we actually are at a, a loss of about did you say two million? At the time for, of my study, yep, it was a little over two million dollars. 
Yeah. And so um, we know that mostly that is because of the formulas and whatnot, and it's complicated. Um, but it sounds like what we need would be for more of uh, Northampton students to stay in the district to reduce that discrepancy. I'm just wondering um, if you recommend that or if there's some sort of what you see might be problematic about that approach, just sort of your overall view um, in an approach to, to work with the information you've given us. Although I understand you just gave us several excellent <laughs> recommendations. Thank you. Um, the, uh, in 2016, Abacus Associates did a really comprehensive study of why district families were leaving for charter schools. And so I would definitely ask Dr. Provost for that. He would be happy to share it with you. Um, it probably more information that, than you want to read. And some of it is hard to read. Um, for, for me, it, it was hard to read at the time. Um, but that, that gets at why families uh, are leaving the district. Um, my own sensibility is that we, I was, I used to focus much more on, on families leaving. You know, I think it hurt my professional ego a little bit too, um, because I, you know, as a, as a public school teacher, I, um, hang on, I'm just going to check this, change this research. As a public school teacher, I just, you know, took so much pride in our schools and when it almost felt like kind of a rejection when um, families left the district. Um, but what I learned, not just through school, my, my studies, but particularly this study, was that families are actively choosing our, the district schools for lots of really sound pedagogical reasons that our district schools have all kinds of things that cannot be offered, are not offered and can't be offered by charter schools or private schools or in a homeschool kind of setting. Starting to be starting with, it's an entire district. So um, one of the, you know, charter schools, private schools um, and vocational schools, they're all clear on their missions. And when families enroll children in those types of schools, you can make some real safe assumptions about why they're doing that. The district schools don't have that. It's not, you know, district, that mission is undefined for district schools. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity for um, districts to include families, especially, um, and educators, and of course, led by the district leaders like you all, um, in defining the mission and having, you know, being clear about, about what that is. And districts can, you know, you've got the preschool to 12 offering for students, which is phenomenal. And, you know, private school, private schools, charter schools, vocational schools, they're one school compete, you're a district of six, you're a small district. So you can actually do, a, you know, you can be so, so much more nimble and responsive in a smaller district. Um, some districts are huge, but just being a district offering that whole menu of educational opportunities to students is something that individual schools um, don't have. So I would definitely encourage us, you all to focus on what pulls families into the district, why they're choosing the schools, what, what we're about. I, um, you know, the, another, another piece I'll, I'll throw out there to consider is what impact school choice has on things like diversity in the district. And in fact, our participation in interdistrict school choice diversifies the school. It makes the schools more diverse than they would be if we didn't participate in interdistrict public school choice. And that's something that families find appealing about the district schools. And so that's a real plus, but to understand maybe a little bit more of those demographics. But I would certainly, I think it's, you know, it would be a wonderful time to really look at everything that the district schools have to offer, try to become more coherent about it, promote the district schools and create a strong, strong partnerships with those families, you know, who are actively choosing the district. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? I don't see any. So again, our, our deep gratitude, thank you. This was really fascinating and we're so grateful for your work. Um, so thank you so much for presenting it to us, Julie. And, um, and thank you for your offers to you know, continue these conversations. So 
Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate and all of your work on behalf of this district that provided me with just wonderful, wonderful professional experience and great education for all three of my kids. <laughs> thank you. All right, good night. Okay, school committee, what's your pleasure? Do you wanna finish out new business or go back up to um, our reports? Anyone have any thoughts? Oh, okay. Um, if so, why don't we finish out um, new business? Except, actually, mem is member Rob member Robbins. Let me check in with you real quick. Do you want to do your curriculum report? We actually uh, we for our next meeting. Um, it's not till May eighteenth. We did. We're not on the agenda to read out our mission statement, which we were going to put in for approval. Um, if that's what you're referring to. Um, I, I was just going down the uh, all of the different subcommittees and I just wanted to, um, in case you were not gonna be here later on, I wanted to make sure that I well, uh, checked you wanna, in on you. you. Wanna, um, uh, Member Levy's happy to share that and read it, but that was something that we needed to be put out to vote by the committee. So it's the description of what our committee is about that the committee came to resolution. You okay. Take about two minutes, I think. Sure, I mean, is it okay? That wasn't on the agenda. It, it was supposed to be on the agenda. Oh, okay. It was bumped last time and it should have been on this one, I think. Um, Annie, is that okay if, if it wasn't, if it was just slated for a report and not for, this is for a vote? It's, we were asked to bring forward a description of that subcommittee, so we created one. And is it just for information or are we meant to vote on it? I think you meant to vote on it. If we're meant to vote on it, then it then am I right that it needs that needs to be uh, set on the agenda? It does, and, and I apologize, Member Robbins. Um, I didn't realize that that was one of the things that did was supposed to be forwarded from the last agenda. So I'll fix that for June, I guess. But I think if it's all right with you, Mayor um, Member Robbins, could read it just for information purposes. Absolutely. Okay. Well, actually, I, that's fine. I mean, it can wait till June. There's, it's not a burning issue. Let's let's move forward if that's okay. Okay. Do you have anything else on, for the curriculum subcommittee that you want to report out on, or no? Nope. That's good. All right. Excellent. All right. We're, I know we're jumping around this evening. I, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Back down to new business. Let's. Um, why don't may I take a moment to um, proclaim School Lunch Hero Day? Um, so this is an official proclamation for School Lunch Hero Day. Um, I don't know if it's possible to put it up on the screen real quick because it's got kind of a cool graphic. Um, so whereas nutritious meals at school are an essential part of the school day, and whereas the staff of the district school meals and nutrition department are committed to providing healthful, nutritious meals to the district's children, and whereas the men and women who prepare and serve school meals help nurture our children through their daily interaction and support. And whereas the day of Friday, May 6, 2022 is School Lunch Hero Day. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Northampton School District expresses its deep appreciation to these valuable employees and commends their good work on behalf of children. So thank you to our School Lunch Heroes. Um, and Next on the agenda is um, a resolution supporting the fair share amendment that's sponsored by myself and member Agna. <clears throat> member Agna, would you like to read the resolution? Uh, yes, I would like to. Okay, please. Um, the Northampton School Committee resolution in support of the fair share amendment. Whereas Massachusetts needed new revenue for our transportation and public education systems even before the COVID-19 pandemic and long-term funding is now needed, is needed now more than ever to lift our economy into an equitable and long-lasting recovery. And whereas Northampton's chapter 70 state school aid has remained stagnant for over 20 years, though required net school spending has steadily increased with the city of Northampton's general fund making up and far exceeding the difference in support of the Northampton public schools, even with the imposed 2.5% annual limit on raising property tax revenue. And 
whereas the 2019 Student Opportunity Act was passed after the Foundation Budget Review Commission determined that the state's foundation budget formula, which determines state aid to each district, had been underfunding school districts by more than $1 billion a year for essential educational services. And while that reform was the first significant update to the dysfunctional formula since 1993, it was rightly directed at lower income districts that rely heavily on chapter 70 for required net school spending and has not resulted in an appreciable increase in state aid for the Northampton Public Schools. And whereas additional funding is needed to maintain the progress school Northampton Public Schools have made over the last 10 years in class size, social emotional supports, and in hiring additional teachers and support staff. And whereas major investments in public education are needed to help students recover academically, socially, and emotionally from the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the best way to help working families and build a stronger economy for us all is to make sure that we have quality public schools for our children, affordable public higher education, and a reliable transportation system. And whereas students need a well-rounded education, founded on a rich and varied curriculum that includes science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, music, art, and athletics. And whereas new state revenue is necessary to rebuild crumbling roads and bridges, improve our public schools from pre-K through college, invest in fast and reliable public transportation, make public higher education affordable again, and expand opportunities for healthy walking and bicycling. And whereas wealthy Massachusetts residents saw their investments grow during this pandemic while working families struggled and Massachusetts wealthiest residents should pay their fair share to support our communities and grow our economies. Therefore, let it be resolved that the Northampton School Committee supports the proposed fair share amendment that would create an additional tax of four percentage points on annual income above $1 million and dedicate the funds raised by this tax to quality public education, affordable public colleges and universities, and for repair and maintenance of roads, bridges, and public transportation. Therefore, be it further resolved that the clerk of the Northampton School Committee shall send a copy of this resolution to Governor Charles Baker, Attorney General Maura Healy, State Senator Joe Comerford, State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, State President Karen Spilka, and House Speaker Ronald Mariano. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I would like to um, I would like to thank Andrea Gito who asked that we um, take up this resolution. Um, thank you so much for that request. Very very happy to do so. Um, and I just want to note that the City Council passed um, a resolution supporting the Fair Share Amendment um, at their last City Council meeting. So we will be joining them in in fighting for this. Um, Member Sarah Cox. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm incredibly in support of, uh, of this resolution and um, I'm especially excited to support it because you know this school committee at our last meeting um, voted through a budget that was greater than what um, our city um, had, had put forward for us to um, to have as a total budget amount. And we did that, um, you know, several members that, that voted in favor of it said that they were doing it in order to show what our schools actually need in order to, uh, to, to provide quality education. And so um, I'm really glad that we're pairing that statement with this statement um, because it, you know, that high quality education shouldn't only come 
on the backs of, uh, of increased property taxes. They should absolutely, absolutely come on um, uh, from a more progressive taxation system. So thank you so much for bringing this. Thank you. Any other, Member Gacy? Uh, do we need a motion to accept that resolution? And if so, I will make that. Thank you. Second. Second. Motion is made by Member Gacy. I believe seconded by Member Levy, I think, who I can't see, but I think I heard. Um, any further discussion on this resolution? Okay, seeing none, roll call, please, Annie. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins. Absolutely. Member Gazy. Yes. And Member Serafi Cox. Yes. And thank you everyone for supporting that. Um, next, we have a vote to approve calendar of school committee meetings. Um, and I believe Annie gave us both a, um, a uh, I lost my papers, um, gave us a subcommittee calendar and um, sort of a, a list of the meetings that have happened and meetings um, to happen. And so I, um, I'm really happy to present this. This was sort of a real surprise to me that the school committee doesn't have a schedule, a regular schedule for subcommittee meetings. I, I believe that every other standing committee, subcommittee, multi-member body, um, in that meets in public in the city has a schedule that is posted and is available for the public so that they can have a reasonable expectation and awareness of when these these bodies meet. Um, you know, this is also something that I think allows members, <laughs> the participants in, on these um, in these meetings, to um, to be able to plan and schedule and. Um, and sort of, and to this point, you know, I've had a couple of constituents ask me um, the day of the month that school subcommittees meet because that's that's how they're accustomed to um, dealing with other subcommittee, um, other subcommittees. So um, this is something that I'd really like the school committee to consider. I think it's really, really important for transparency for the public. Um, and and um, so that's my introduction, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anybody? Member Agna. I guess I just want clarification. I, th I think that these were, this was the original schedule that has been used for uh, however many years. Um, is that um, something that, or Andy, you can tell me that. Is it all right if I answer this, Mayor? Please, yes. Um, this, every um, first, Meeting in January, um, we vote the school committee votes on the regular meeting schedule of just school committee meetings, and this is a version where I've put subcommittee meetings in there. In the way that over the years, I've seen it work best, um, just as it falls out or how it used to be in some ways. Um, the first until now, I think until April, maybe I've, I've put in all the all the subcommittee meetings that we've had. So if you look at uh, February and eight and March. That's a lot of meetings. That's too many, too many meetings for, you know, for administratively for me to keep up with, for us in the central office to keep up with. So, but you know, these are different. This, these are unique circumstances. But I would like to see a better rhythm to the subcommittee meetings. And so everything after pretty much June first, except there are a couple of things. I think there's a curriculum subcommittee meeting already posted for that. But after that, we'll follow the recommendations that I gave in that other document where I outline sort of the reasons for having the, um, this particular schedule. Some committee meetings, well, there's really only one subcommittee that definitely meets every month and that's rules and policy. And that's simply because it, it 
it takes the most, it does the most volume of work, I'll say, and the most volume of administrative work. Um, but, you know, some subcommittee meetings um, meet just as needed. Some subcommittee meetings uh, meet at certain times of the year, some meet every other month. And of course, then there's ad hoc subcommittee meetings and that need to be scheduled on their own. And the way we've been doing it is I've been spending so much of my time just scheduling meetings and not able to get to some really important work like minutes and things like that. So this would be really helpful to me and everybody at the central office. Um, you bring up a good point. If there's a concern that having a set date and time um, would mean that a subcommittee must meet even if there isn't something on their agenda or something that they yeah. need to meet on, no, that's, that's, not, um, that's not necessary. So, you know, other uh, elsewhere in the city, if there's not something and, and the committee doesn't need to meet, then that meeting just gets canceled. So this doesn't, this doesn't compel you to meet more. It just gives structure to the meetings and helps people plan. Uh, member Sarah Cox. Um, just a, an addition that um, in, the, in the schedule, um, the curriculum subcommittee meeting and the rules and policy subcommittee meeting are listed for May, but the negotiation subcommittee has a meeting on May 16th at five o'clock. Yes, I know. I, I wrote this calendar maybe six weeks ago, sure. so I haven't added that yet. And it got, it got postponed from the last meeting. So like I yep. said, especially negotiating is going to be added because it, it's an as needed subcommittee. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be set in stone. It'll be added <clears throat> into the calendar as we go. And that that's also uh, ad hoc meetings that will happen with those as well. But this is just a standardized, a little bit more standardized so that I'm not spending all my time trying to figure out, uh, you know, trying to schedule meetings. And also, I think for especially for subcommittee chairs, it's just an easier um, and a more efficient way to plan the work of the committee over the year. And I would expect that to do this every year and have this voted on in the January meeting. Uh, so um, I was just, that was a information moment, uh, not anything against it. In fact, uh, it looks like it is a vote. So um, I would make a motion to approve the calendar of school committee meetings for 2022. That was seconded by member Gazy, I believe. Um, member Levy. Sorry if I'm misreading. Um, the superintendent evaluation subcommittee hasn't yet met um, in part, I believe, because that is a cyclical work. And the first meeting is in June, but we haven't established the rest of the meetings yet. And I think I just want to note that in passing this, that those are going to need to be added as well. Yeah. Yes, and I think that um, what, the way it's happened with Superintendent Eval in the past, it's three meetings over a course of two years. Um, and at the end of each meeting, the, uh, it's determined you know, how long it should be before the next meeting. If that makes sense, unless the committee three, wants to do a different three thing. Three meetings over two years. Yep. We don't wanna, we don't wanna over evaluate our superintendent. <laughs> No, but we do want to, well, okay. Well, well, I can, I mean, the superintendent can speak to that. It's a process and it's- It's okay. We don't need to spend time on that right yeah. now. Thanks. Any other questions or comments to the motion on the floor? Okay. Seeing none, roll call, please. Annie? Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Sierra. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. And member Stein. Yes. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. It'd be Thank very helpful. You. Thanks for laying that all out, Annie. Um, okay, next is G, vote to establish a school psychologist internship program with two interns for FY23. Is there a motion then we'll have 
Dr. Provost present. I'll make a motion. I'm okay. always good for that. A motion to approve? Yes. Seconded by Member Davis. Um, Dr. Provost? Thank you very much. I should say that this proposal has already been, in essence, um, approved in the budget. Um, it was in, embedded within the budget reductions that were presented at the last meeting. So now that the financial piece has been taken care of, let me talk about um, the conceptual piece. So our goal here is to strengthen our partnership with the school psychology program at the University of Massachusetts to offer students a internship year after completing the practicum year. So um, school psychologists have to do a practicum just like all other licensed staff in the district does. And then in um, the UMass program, they also have to complete an internship year, which is essentially um, a, a minimum of 30 hours a week. It's a um, essentially almost full-time schedule that staff, that interns would follow over the course of the year. During that time, they'd be able to provide support for our school psychologists and be able to learn um, their craft better by working closely with our school psychologists. They would um, be able to perform a few assessments a week, which is why we reduce the, uh, the line item for independent evaluations provided outside of the district because having interns in place would allow us to have that work done by them. Uh, it's not right to have interns uh, provide such a service to the district with no compensation. The rate that UMass suggests is $15,000. And so the uh, proposal is to have two more individuals join our district, completing internships at UMass at the rate of 15,000 each. We do have um, a very strong relationship with the UMass School Psych Program. We have several um, practicum students every year. And our goal would be to offer a second year um, experience for some of the more promising students. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Member Miller, was that a hand? Go ahead. Um, would these interns have supervision and would their reports be read by a supervisor? They would be supervised by our school psychologists. So it, it would, it would, they can share them to a certain extent. And so we talked about possibly having shared supervision instead of having one school psychologist paired with the individual throughout the year. So that's, there's a little bit of flexibility around that, but it is a requirement that they have supervision from our own school psychologists who would check off their work. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay, roll call please, Annie. Member Miller. Member Miller, we didn't hear you. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. And Member Levy. Yes. Okay. Um, next is H, vote to exempt trips from NHS or the High School to Childs Park from the approval process under school committee policy IJOA. Thank you. This is a proposal that I'm recommending in order to increase access and equity to hands-on learning experiences for students, particularly in science classes at the high school. We were approached by members of the science faculty asking if they can, there could be a way to streamline the process of taking students to Child's Park. Um, as you can see from the map um, at the end of the, the document that supports this, the distance from the high school to the 
far reaches of Child's Park is approximately a quarter of a mile. That is equidistant um, from the distance to, from the high school to the end of our athletic fields. Um, the process of going across the street to Child's Park is currently considered a field trip while going out to the back fields is not considered a field trip. And because it's a field trip, it creates additional um, paperwork requirements for teachers every time they wanna take kids across the street. Um, it also creates equity issues because as the staff have told me, one of the challenges is getting this multi-page document filled out for all of the students in the class so that they're able to go across the street. And so we did some research to see if there was any way that we could streamline the process for them and found that in the regulation, um, a field trip request is required or field trip permission is required for any property that is deemed off school grounds. Um, what was a little bit um, unclear under the regulation is who has the property to deem something within school grounds. I think probably the most clear and transparent way to do that would be to have the school committee make the declaration. And so my real request here is for you to de declare for the purposes of field trips, um, the Child's Park area to be on school grounds so that staff who wanna take students over there do not have to complete the field trip process for each visit. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, Member Sarah Cox. Um, I'll make a motion and then I have a question. Um, I'll move that uh, to approve um, the, sorry, do, do you need, can I, can I just uh, say this item? Because <laughs> I feel like uh, Superintendent Provost just outlined the, the motion better than I could repeat it. Sure, is there a second? A second. Seconded by member Agna. And what's your question, member? Um, mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, Superintendent Provost, if uh, you have consulted legal counsel on the um, legal implications of extending school ground to private property? I have not. I mean, that would be my only question because Child's Park is not a public, a public park. I mean, it's open to the public, but it's not owned by the public. Mm -hmm. I don't know, a Superintendent Provost, if that gives you pause, it looks like the wheels are turning in your head. I mean, I, I could bring it back to legal review and then bring it back to the committee. I, I mean, my, my research on this was just basically going through the regulations. I, I do think, you know, we, we have field trips. Um, we do have coverage. We have insurance coverage that um, covers students on field trips. That would be my main um, concern. Yeah. I don't have that concern um, with this because currently we are taking students out there. We're just having them sign the forms first. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a great idea and I love the idea of, of being able to do it. Um, I, and I would, I'm not withdrawing my motion, um, but I would suggest just touching base with attorney Taylor to make sure that there's no ramifications of declaring okay. that private property is school grounds. <laughs> For the purposes of field trips. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, so are we going to choose not to vote on this tonight and bring it to the next meeting? Uh, I did not withdraw my, my motion. So, uh, I mean, unless Superintendent Propos would prefer to withdraw it, I, I think it's fine to go ahead and um, vote on it tonight. All right. Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing none, roll call please, Annie. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins. Oh, sorry. Uh, Member Robbins um, is is uh, needed to needed to leave the meeting and send her her apologies. 
Thanks. Okay. It's probably like four o'clock in the morning over there. I was surprised she lasted as long as she did. <laughs> Member Gazy. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. And Member Miller. Yes. Okay, that passes. Next is an update on the ad hoc late start subcommittee. We got a little update from member uh, Goldman earlier, but uh, Dr. Provost. And I think that update was quite adequate. Just to reiterate, um, we did meet with Superintendent Morris and, and members of the Amherst Pelham school com committees, as well as uh, members of both school communities to develop a draft survey. And when it comes time for my superintendent's report, I'll give you a sneak peek at what it looks like. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's go back up to what we haven't done yet, which is under reports. So uh, first up, rules and policy. Member Gazy, you have a few items for us, yes? Yes, um, I do. I was uh, wanting to... Um, get a second reading and vote on the rules of procedure that we worked on, uh, ACAB, the sexual harassment one, and BDB, the school committee officers. Um, and then I have several to um, bring to the committee for the first thing after that. I don't know how you wanna proceed on that. Um, when we we took a lot of the mass policy, uh, suggested policies, uh, their advice. And um, if you look in your packets, you can see where we proposed changes. I believe they're highlighted or notated. Uh, there's not a lot of them. Um, and so I'm ready to hear any discussion. Okay, so did, uh, which ones did you want to do first? You want to do the second readings and votes first? Yes. yes. Okay. So first up, uh, rules of procedure. Yes. Um, do you want to discuss them individually or do we want to take them as a group? Uh, it depends on how much you trust us, I guess. Uh -huh. um, we worked long and hard on this and, you know, it was a collaborative effort. Um, and we took the best advice of mask and, most of the changes that we made were sort of um, technical ones, I think. So if I okay. assume you had a look. Um, so just to clarify, we're talking rules of procedure, ACAB and BDB. For, yes. These are the second readings and vote. Okay. Yes. And Emily, did you have more to say on that? Because you were there. I was just gonna make a motion. Oh, yay. <laughs> Let's move it on. <laughs> um, I would uh, make a motion to approve uh, the um, policies and rules of procedure. Um, rules of procedure A, C, A, B, and B, D, B, um, as presented in our packet. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by member Miller. Um, Member Levy. Thanks for all your work on this, folks. Um, on the, the rules of procedure, there's a comment. Um, I'm just curious about it. It's a, a section 11.1 .1 evaluation. Superintendent's final written annual evaluation will consider input from all members of the school committee and other stakeholders using a formal process to capture members' feedback. And then it says, Holly is to ask the school committee about this suggestion. And I was just wondering if you could let us know if you need a suggestion about that, or if that's just an old comment and needs to be resolved. I have grandchildren running around trying to get them in bed. And so I lost the process there. 
when you were reading. So is this on the rules of procedure that you had the question? Or yeah, it's under 11.1. There's just a, you've got a, a highlighted sentence and it says you needed to get feedback from the school committee. And I wasn't sure if this was your, Hold when on. you were going to do that. We just wanted to know whether you agreed with that. I do. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was just one area that we thought um, if anybody, you know, the other ones were like changing website names and uh, changing the name from executive secretary to clerk. This was something a little bit more substantial. So that's why I just highlighted it to bring it to your attention. Thanks. Yeah, I'm all for it and would even push for stronger language to ensure that it's taken in, that it's an active part. But I think I think having that language there is great. Thank you. That's that was my only comment and question. Yeah. OK, thanks. Um, can I ask a, so a question under um, meeting? So 14.2. This is around public comment. Um, so there'll be time for the public to address the committee. Time for speaker will be at the discretion of the chair. But then 14.3 says during the public session of the meeting, discussion by the public will be limited to three minutes per person per issue at the discretion of the chair. So it's just at minimum, it's redundant. Um, but it, what's, what's the pleasure that it be three minutes or that it's at the discretion? Um, I, it, my recollection is that we were intending for it to be three minutes per speaker or at the discretion of the chair that, that, um, of course there are times when if there's 200 people that want to speak, you may need to decrease that to two minutes. Um, and I thought that it was more clear when we were editing it. So, um. Let me look back at, at my notes from that meeting to see if maybe I can find a, a more clear version. But that was, I believe, the spirit. Any other questions or comments? We could always make it so that you know, in parentheses, there's three minutes when you say the instead of the 15. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say that if um, under 14.2, if, if you just took that, if you took out time per speaker will be out again. So it's just that's addressing the the total time for public comment. And then 14.3 is about the time per person. It's already in there and it already says it's the discretion of the chair. So that would eliminate the redundancy and maybe be less confusing. Oh, yeah, so. I see what you're saying, yeah. So there will be, so it would read, there will be time for the public to address the committee. And then the next Happy. one, and it just ends right there, right? Um, I mean, you could leave at the discretion of the chair if you want to say that, you know, how long that time is, is at the discretion. It's just, you're, you're removing the time per from yeah. that section, because it's in the following section. Yeah. Member, um, Member Stein, do you want to say something while they're working on that? Yeah, this is um, this is related, but it's for fourteen point three, and it's the um, the per person per issue, and I I'm wondering if the I mean this is existing, right? I don't this hasn't been changed, but I'm wondering if if it's the policy currently, like, how do we read this? Like, so could someone have three minutes on each new agenda item? 
or do they only have three minutes total? Right, it sort of seems a bit ambiguous there to have three minutes per person per issue. I think that's a good point. Also, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we say anywhere here that that the public can only speak to items on the agenda. So to your point, Member Stein, issues are infinite. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I would um, revise my motion to, um, to pass these with revisions to the rules and policy to take out that time per speaker will be section uh, in 14.2 and to just take out the per issue in 14.3 because that is our current practice is just three minutes per person. Um, Member Stein, did you have something else? No, I'm sorry. I meant to put the hand down. It's okay. Member Levy? Sorry, I don't mean to belabor this. I um, I just want to make sure there's transparency that it, that even though it's at the, I just want to, can you say member Sarah Cox, what is it that you're suggesting gets taken out again? In 14.2, yep. um, that the last sentence would read, there will be time for the public to address the committee at the discretion of the chair. And then in 14.3, it outlines what that looks like, but Great. we take okay. out the per issue Perfect. from that. Okay, second. thank you. Yep. We'll be done. And okay. so that I can get it clear in 14.3, we take out per person per issue or not per person, just per issue. Okay. Yeah, and, and leave in per person because it's three minutes per person. Okay. Okay, is that how it, does that look good? There will be time for the public to address the committee at the discretion of the chair and then limited to three. Um, 14.2 still needs a little work, but we trust you. Okay, Emily, make a note. <laughs> or else try to put it in the shape that it was because I, I'm having editing problems. I've got the notes. Oh, good. <laughs> good, thank you. Okay, any, any further discussion on the rules of procedure? Um, okay, so I think since we're working on these individually, uh, roll call please, Annie. Uh, was it, I think that the motion was for both the policies and the rules of procedure. Am I right, Member Sophie Cox? Oh, was that right? Okay, apologies. Okay, so we've moved on, we've done that one. Let's move on to uh, AECAB. And... Any? So ACAB uh, is a policy about uh, prohibiting um, sexual harassment and other forms of harassment and discrimination. And uh, Member Giese, it looks like you are perhaps available again. Yes, as long as I figure out how to work my computer. <laughs> Hold on, granddad just can't get together to get them in bed. Um, this one was again, mostly uh, we're talking about ACAB, right? Yes. And this one was pretty, it had been worked on by, uh, um, I'm having a senior moment here. Um, our attorney. Attorney Taylor. Yeah, about, uh, she had done extensive work on it and we just took in, there wasn't a lot of changes to be made when we looked at the, um, at the recent uh, changes that Mask had suggested. 
So it looks like there's maybe is is what's highlighted an addition. Yeah. So what's highlighted is the first sentence where bigotry and intolerance are not accepted. Is that an an addition or a change somehow? And is that why it's highlighted? I believe it's an addition. Okay. Thank you. And that came from some of our policy work, you know. So. that Attorney Taylor had done. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on this addition? Okay, I don't see any. So we can move on to BDB, School uh, Committee Officers. Here it was uh, pretty, um, straightforward and we only had that all answer parliamentary inquiries. Um, I see, and it, is this also an addition down under clerk? Oh, I forgot that. Uh, yes. And what was the other thing that you mentioned? I don't see another highlighted bit. Was there another? There was a little, there was a little um, I'm looking for it now because I just saw it. Uh, number seven, as presiding officer, the chair will answer parliamentary questions. We just took oh. out. All. Okay, oh. I do see that now. Thank you. Um, okay, and so, and then under clerk, the addition is where video recordings exist of the meetings summarized in the minutes, links to the video recordings will be included in the minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was, um, I believe, a recommendation from MASC. Okay. Any discussion on those changes? I don't see any. So I think we can go ahead and take a roll call. Oh, sorry, Member Stein. This is just one question. I, 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 don't, know that, I don't know where if there's a term policy it would go in, but... Um, no, no, it, it would go in a different policy. For, forgive me. Thank you. Oh. Um, okay, so we can take a roll call on these three policies or um, the rules of procedure in these two policies uh, as a group, please. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins is not with us now. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. Okay, thank you. And so we're moving on to the ones that are on first reading. So the first um, first one is ADDA quarry requirements. Correct. Um, and this is the part where you don't ask questions, right? You just, I mean, we don't discuss them. We just sort of list them out, correct? I'm seeing a nod from members. Thanks, here. you're going for first reading. I'm still a little foggy on this. Um, that it seems like that is correct. So yeah. uh, this is different how I've done first readings before. So member Sarah Cox, so this is, um, so member Gazy is just gonna go through what these changes are and we don't uh, deliberate or vote. We just take in, okie dokie. Yeah. Right, and I'm trying to get these up because I had so many tabs open that now I can't find them. School committee, oh God. Emily, if you've got this on, while I dig through my files again, my drive. <laughs> uh, no, sure. laughing. no laughing. No, <laughs> I'm I'm la I'm laughing because it's uh, the age old problem of having too many tabs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Do you want me to read what the change is? I I almost have it up. Okay. Uh, I'm just three sixteen rules and policy. I've, there's so many little thingy dingies and I'm such an old dinosaur. 
<laughs> okay. Right. So ADA, ADDA, ADA. Corey requirements. And I'm pretty sure that uh, so ADDA was at the um, April 12th meeting that we edited that one. Yes. And there was a lot of very old language uh, 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 in the old uh, policy. Um, it was adopted in 2005. Um, I know that there was the internet then, but a lot of the things that were listed were were quite antiquated. So um, the additions um, are, we, we just took the new MASC policy and then made our own additions that are underlined. And uh, Superintendent Provost, uh, Dr. Provost, uh, sort of gave us a little schooling about how how Corey's are who gets to look at Corey's and perhaps you could speak to that. Sure. So this sure. policy explains how background checks are conducted in the district. Who is um, required to have a background check? What type of background checks are done for? different classes of people who may come in contact with students, whether they're volunteers or whether they're employees or whether they're contractors. Um, it talks about the factors that go into making a determination of suitability if something should show, show up on a quarry. And it also talks about um, how confidentiality is provided around the results of, confidential, of um, the quarry checks and federal background checks. Okay, then moving on to uh, ACR. Mm -hmm. um, there was just uh, a little rewording in what the school committee commits to on line two. And then there was a whole section added straight from mask that's highlighted in yellow. Um, and, well, and uh, ACR is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, ACR is a completely new policy. Oh. For, for us, is mean. that correct? That's what I have written down. Yeah. yeah. Harassment and retaliation. And uh, so it was really pretty much adopted. Although I am still confused about whether AC non-discrimination, ACR means AC revised, right? Is that what the R stands for? No, it doesn't, it's not revised. I think it may be regulation. I, mm -hmm. I can see if I can look that up, but AC still exists as a policy. And, and, we ACR, have that. and ACR will be a new piece that goes underneath AC. So that's the AC discrimination, non-discrimination. Correct. Oh man. So there it is. Read it and weep. <laughs> okay. And then the last one is. Before we, before we move on, we've got a couple hands. Member Stein. Oh, I wasn't even looking at that. Um, I, I have a very uh, ignorant question, which is I don't really understand first reads and second reads. So yeah. I just didn't know if um, more experienced members of the chair could kind of give us new members uh, education on, on, on this. That would be great. Sure. Member Serafie Cox, would you like to? Since I, I also am a little bit confused as to the point of the first reads, but I would love to know. Um, uh... I did uh, first reads and second reads predated my <laughs> extensive term on the on the school committee. Um, in the past, 
we had done the first read in order to get feedback from the school committee. And then the second read would, was where we ultimately passed it. And the idea was that then we get the feedback in the first read and then the second read would just pass because we had already gotten feedback. What ended up happening is that both times there would be feedback and it just got very arduous. So uh, in order to <laughs> decrease that amount of time, uh, we were moving to more of a like first read of let's just walk you through what we did. And then on the second read, if you, you can come to the next meeting when we do the second read with any revisions, you know, ideally written down and specific that you would like to, to see it, uh, in the policy. Thank you. So do you have uh, anything more member Stein to ask on that? Member, member Levy has oh. her hand up though. Thanks. I just would love to better understand how ACR is, is ACR replacing something that we already had in place? I mean, we do have policies on discrimination and harassment. And so what, how is, is this differ, complement, or? Good question. Um, ask, ask the man there. Yes, Dr. Provost. It does not replace AC, it just becomes an add-on to AC. So there's some definitions here that maybe not part of the um, core policy. It identifies some reporting procedures or specifically identifies like in individuals within the district and their telephone numbers. Um, so it's, it's kind of like an addendum to policy AC. Okay, so I, I um, thank you. One of the things that I am concerned about is the definition of discrimination. Is that something that's coming from MASC? Yes, this is this model policy is almost word for word from MASC, except where we included our own information about telephone numbers and individuals to contact. Okay. I'm like, yeah, very concerned about that definition, but I obviously, if it's coming from MASC, then it has ideally been tried and it's been passed because it works for, I, this is just, to me, that's not what discrimination is. Uh, that might be harassment, but discrimination and harassment aren't the same thing. And so I, I don't necessarily want us as a district to have our, a, definition of discrimination that's separate from what is coming from MASC, but this, I, I'm trying not to laugh, but this, this, this definition is really not a good one. So I, I would, um, I, I'm not really sure what to do with that other than I'm happy to uh, help reword it. But again, I don't know if the committee wants to reword wording from MASC. I'm just curious what others think about that. And then if you want me to help, I'm happy to, but if you want to leave it, we can, but I might keep thinking about that. Dr. Provost, did, did Since you... it is a, a policy that sits under AC, I think maybe the best thing to do would be to try to harmonize the language with, a, with the definitions that are in the core policy AC. So we could take a look at both of them when we finally vote on this. like the way you put that harmonize. Yeah, uh, I'm writing it down. <laughs> uh, member Stein? I mean, I would, um, if I understood um, member Sarah B. Cox correctly, like in, you know, I would just encourage um, member Levy to maybe uh, send some suggestions on changes that they could then use when they think about harmonizing the entire document. Um, that some of that conversation may be able to happen at the subcommittee meeting um, and then we'd benefit from that when it comes back for that second read you know um, obviously entirely up to your discretion but I, I think MASC is a good place to start but I tend to agree with you about um, uh, this not really being a, 
a sterling example that we want to just keep without tinkering with. So um, yeah, just a suggestion or actually a request for us. Uh, yeah, I, I think to Dr. Provost's comment, I, I would I obviously don't have it in front of me right now. I would want to see what the definition is in AC because maybe that one's just fine. Well, I would love to have your input when uh, we get down to it. Member Sarvi Cox. Um, I just looked at uh, policy AC and it does not have a definition. Um, it, it implicitly defines discrimination, but not explicitly. Um, but it does not define harassment. So um, I, I reiterate that that would be great. Also, um, we passed a, a, a slight revision to uh, policy AC uh, at last month's meeting. So, um, so we just reviewed that one <laughs> is what I'm saying. Um, and this one was just a, a new policy, uh, a new policy that was supposed to complement it. Um, but yeah, so I think at least from my perspective, the, the, the process that would work best would be for, you know, maybe you to come with some specific language, Dina, or to work with uh, Member Gizzi, uh to 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 come back to next month's meeting with some revisions. Because yeah, um, that's it. now that I'm reading it through your eyes, that's it is pretty laughable. Thanks for highlighting that, Member Miller. Um, when I'm reading it. It, it's it it doesn't it describes to me harassment, but discrimination is something completely different that's not in that paragraph. I would want to be able to re suggest revisions, but that's my initial comment: is that it describes harassment, but it does not describe discrimination. Okay, sounds like we'll be moving towards creating our own definition to add to that. Um, okay, uh, are we on to BDE? Yes, the last one is BDE. And this one was mostly, we had to add uh, a couple of subcommittees, the curriculum and the negotiating one. Um, we just cleaned up the language on when the election should be. Uh, and does we have to add, add on, obviously, uh, parts on the curriculum committee and negotiations in the descriptions for the responsibilities. Okay. Any other questions or comments? On BDE. All right. I don't. Oh, sorry, Member Stein. Um, part. This is a question that you know. Tonight we were. Uh, we didn't hear sort of the mission statement or charge of the uh, curriculum committee, but I'm noticing here that this might be some version of that. Um, so I'm just. Uh, uh, in terms of timing. Will this return to us like sort of after that other um, sort of statement about the committee is talked about or? Uh, yeah, um, member Sarah Cox or, yeah. Uh, I mean, it looks like uh, Superintendent Provost was raising his hand as well, but I was just gonna say the intent 
our understanding was that the, um, the curriculum subcommittee's uh, description was going to be approved tonight and therefore could be added for next month's meeting. Um, so presumably it will be on next month's meeting and then we can add it in at that time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything more on these first readings? I don't see any. So, okay, thank you, Member Gacy, for that. Battery, 90%, connected to Amy's iPhone. Okay, what's happening? Um, moving on to budget and property, Member Goldman, do you have a report? No, I have no update at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, superintendent evaluation, Member Levy. I feel like we talked about this briefly before. No? Yes, I'm also not necessarily the <laughs> spokesperson for this group of people. Oh, oh, we, meet, we meet in June. Okay. That's our update. We're, I'm gonna still, I'm gonna keep on calling on you until this happens, <laughs> understand. Apologies. Um, okay, Nick, we are up to the business administrator report. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my, May, uh, my May business administrator report um, in your packet, you have a few documents as usual, um, including the FY22 appropriation report, which um, it's our, just our monthly expenditure report on our local budget um, through April 30th. Um, at this time, we've begun our end of year closing processes. Um, so you will see the deficits in various accounts begin to disappear as we do transfers. Um, at our June school committee meeting, I will request permission to make all necessary transfers in order to um, close the year. Uh, many of these transfers will be greater than $10,000, um, which, as you know, requires school committee approval to do. Um, but the, the way in which one has to do the end of the year closing process, that you can't know all the transfers that you have to make until the year is actually over. Um, so, you know, traditionally, um, business administrators have um, asked permission of the committee to um, be able to do transfers to in order to complete that process, um, even though some will, will be over $10,000. Um, <clears throat> Uh, item number two on my report this month, um, I wanted to inform the committee that we were recently awarded a one-time assistance grant from DESE uh, in the amount of $10,755. Um, this aid was distributed to districts that experienced, quote, pandemic-related disruptions in their enrollment. Um, I had no idea this money was coming. Um, honestly, I got an email about it during April vacation and a couple of days later, the treasurer reached out saying, what is this? Um, but anyway, this aid was, um, it's considered a grant and is not an addition to our local budget. Um, the money will be used to cover some of the unexpected expenses that have come up during this year. Um, as you know, there have been many. Um, for gifts under a thousand dollars this month, um, we were uh, there was a total of two thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars in donations um, during the month since our last meeting. Um, all of these donations were were under a thousand dollars. They they just added up to that total of twenty nine eighteen, um, and all of them were given in support of the mural project at JFK and NHS that um, Member Davis had spoken of uh, earlier. Um, this evening, um, which I certainly do want to go see now that I know it's it's um, getting close to its completion. Um, and then the last uh, piece of my report for this month is you have the um, two copies of the bill warrants that member Agna approved um, during the month of April. So um, that's my business report for the month of, uh, well, for the month of May. Um, and I can move right into the personnel report if, if you'd like. Um, in, excuse me, April, there were four new hires. Um, there were seven separations and one transfer um, of uh, an employee from one position to another. Um, our demographics of this um, looked like 
Uh, 87% of our um, employees that separated were female, 14.3% were male, 71.4% were Caucasian, 14.3% identified as both being Hispanic and white, uh, and 14.3% identified as being both black and white. Um, for the year, we're now up to 66 separations, 77.3% uh, of them being female, 21.2% of them male, 1.5% non-binary. 83.3% um, of employees who separated were Caucasian, 4.5% Asian, 4.5% Hispanic, 3% Black, 3% uh, identified as both being Hispanic and white, and 1.5% identified as being both Black and white. Um, for vacancies currently, <clears throat> at Bridge Street School, we still have a one-to-one -one RN position vacant, um, as well as an ESP. Uh, at Leeds, we have one ESP vacancy. At JFK, we have a 0.5 FTE PE teacher vacancy, um, a math interventionist vacancy, um, along with six ESP vacancies. Um, at Northampton High School, we have a, the school psychologist position is still vacant. We have one ESP vacancy, um, as well as two custodians. Um, and then for district-wide positions, we have a vacant floating custodian position, um, as well as one crossing guard. Um, so that's my personnel report for this month. Sorry, I see a couple hands. Member Sarfi Cox? You, oh, hold on, you can't unmute. Thank you. Um, I um, noticed in the personnel report um, that there were three um, separations from one program uh, at Bridge Street School. Um, that program, of course, also is related to uh, an MOA that this body passed last month. So just wondering uh, if you could speak to um, anything related to that. I don't really know why any of the folks from um, that particular program separated. Uh, well, actually two of the three of them I don't. The other one, I believe, took a job as a lead pre-K teacher somewhere else. I'm not sure where, um, but I, I don't have any further information on why any of the other folks um, left that program during the month of, of April. Okay, well, um, I mean, I've been in communication with, uh, with John and Annie about getting that MOA moved forward. So I um, uh, would love to see that happen. Uh, Member Levy. Thanks. Um, can you help me with the math? I was starting to do it and then it's a little too late for me to do it successfully. Can you add together the, the percentages of the people of color who've left the district in this report? Uh, yeah, give me one second. Um, would you like me to include um, folks that identify as being more than one race? In I that? would, please. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, it would be um, just a 100% uh, minus 83.3. Uh, so you're looking at like 17 16 point, Yeah, 16.7 percent would be um, individuals of color. Okay, thanks. And do we know what is the percentage of individuals of color who work in our district? Um. <clears throat> It is lower than that. I, off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm going to need to look on the DESI website, um, okay. but uh, I can um, I can get back to you on that if you would like, Member Levy. I would, and I think um, I've, this is something I've asked for before, but I just want to reiterate that. To me, I appreciate hearing the numbers, but unless we can compare those numbers to the current populations of our district, they're not as helpful to me. But I am really concerned that, that in doing that quick math, I felt nervous that that number is substantially higher than our 
number of folks of color who work in the district. And if we are losing people of color at higher rates, um, that's a red flag and something that we need to be addressing and understanding why and uh, doing the exit interviews that we've been talking about, but also um, putting in place measures to ensure that that's not happening. And to me, that may speak. I don't know if um, an, an equity audit would get at that as much as it's really looking at the experiences of our students, but I know there's current surveys out there about why people are potentially leaving the district. And I hope that we are different, that we're collecting demographic data of people and that we're going to be able to parse it out by demographics as well. Because if we're losing people of color at higher rates, we need to be addressing that. While you were, um, while you were just speaking, I did open up um, what I needed to. I found that 10.54% of our district employees um, are individuals of, of color. So the rate at which uh, folks of color are, are leaving is higher than um, the district um, data. Sig significantly. That's really troubling to me. I'm sorry, uh, Nick, can you say that number just one with the points? you know, da, 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 point, blah, blah, blah. It, it like flies in and out of my head. Can you say it just one more time? Um, yes, 10.54% of our um, staff members are individuals of color and 16.7% um, of people who have separated this year um, are individuals of color. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions for Nick? I don't see any, although I can't see all school committee members for some reason. They're all bouncing around. Oh, member Stein. Oh, you're muted, member Stein. Apologies. Um, I had a question just follow up on, on what you were all just discussing. Um, I'm, I'm similarly concerned and I'm wondering, um, and I'm not expecting you to have this answer, Nick, or you, you might not be even the person to get, you know, to pull it together. But I'm wondering if there's a way in which we um, um, can look more deeply at that statistic, uh, meaning like by job type, like like by all a number of factors, how can we look more at that, um, both the percentage of, of folks of color in our staff and that percentage that's leaving? Like, can we look at it in a way that gives us more granularity around um, job type, school, like like something that could give us some more things to to think about than um, just those those blunt numbers. So we might get some a sense behind it. Um, I don't know where we would find that, um, um, Nick, but I'm wondering if you had any ideas. Well, I can. I, I haven't kept specific um, data on on those points. I mean, I can tell you that we've had more ESPs separate from. Um, the district than any other position during the course of the year. Um, but in terms of, of school trends or, or even, you know, programs within school trends, I, I have not done that. I mean, it's certainly doable. It's just a matter of adding the, you know, the extra data points to the, you know, what I'm already keeping. It's certainly doable. I mean, if it's possible for that to be put together, that would be really, it'd be valuable. So I, I, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay, if there are no other questions on Nick's reports, uh, we'll move on to Dr. Provost Superintendent's report. Thank you very much. And I have to do the correct screen share because um, no, I don't know how to do it. I do have a video coming up. Can someone remind me how to um, screen share so the sound comes through? So there's a little box to check when you when you go to hit share screen. There'll be a little box on the bottom left ah, that says share, share sound audio. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
I'd like to begin by commending Northampton High School students Caroline Cooper, Amelia Ritt, and Lily Shipmock for being chosen to showcase the work our district is doing to encourage composting at a recent Massachusetts Farm to School conference. Thank you for representing yourselves and your school proudly on this stage. You make us all very proud of the work you're doing in the district. We're partnering with Self-Evident Education um, to make a first of its kind uh, opportunity available for our community. I wanna just share a short video about that and then I'll talk a little bit more about the event. Lawrence Cadell, and I'm the executive director of Self-Evident Education, and Self-Evident Education, in conjunction with Dr. Power Green and the Northampton Arts Council, is organizing the Power of Truths Conference for June 10th and 11th in Florence, Massachusetts, and we'd love to see you there. You know, Florence has been a place where activists um, going way back to the 19th century have really found a space where they could share ideas, try to build new institutions. Um, at the Power of Truth Conference, we're going to learn about history, we're going to connect with educators and bring artists together uh, in order to help under people understand better uh, the ways in which artists, activists, and educators can come together uh, to understand social justice issues uh, in our nation today. We really hope that the Power of Truths Conference is the place where we can come together in community to start building a just future now. For more information, you can check out NorthamptonArtsCouncil.org or SelfEvidentEducation.com. Again, that's June 10th and 11th, the Power of Truths. We hope to see you there. And I'm, I'm here to announce tonight that I've been coordinating and negotiating with the Power of Truths organizers to make a block of tickets available to our staff, students, and families. Um, so we are uh, purchasing a sizable block, which I think will make it possible for any members of our school community who want to attend the event to uh, do so free of charge. Uh, I want to thank them for the discounts they've offered us based on volume purchases. And I really want to encourage um, not only students and staff, but also family members to check out the Power of Truth because the sessions have, are quite compelling. Next, I want to give an update on some indicators around our district improvement plan. Uh, because we have some additional data to share about our key metrics for measuring success of our efforts with respect to goal four. As a reminder, we had set a goal of increasing the percentage of Hispanic or Latino students meeting or exceeding expectations on the third grade ELA MCAS test from 16% as it was in, 19, in 2019 to 30% by 2024 and increasing the percentage of white third graders meeting or exceeding the expectation is 65%. When we received our results of last year's MCAS, we realized we'd already met the goal with 71% and 31% of those subgroups meeting or exceeding expectations respectively. So there's a check mark in that box and our goal is to keep it checked. Um, those percentages both exceeded statewide averages for their subgroups. We also met or exceeded the statewide averages for multiracial students, students with high needs, students who are learning English and students with disabilities, as well as students without disabilities, as well as economically disadvantaged students and non-economically disadvantaged students. In other words, students did well across the board on our standard two indicator. At this time, I can also report on progress toward meeting increasing graduation rates, which is the fourth metric listed here, and increasing early literacy and numeracy scores, numeracy scores for Hispanic and Latino students, which is the first metric. So this is year-to-year uh, -year changes in our graduation rate. This is um, this is a five-year graduation rate, so it runs two years behind our, our current year. Uh, as a reminder, the goal here was to increase the five-year graduation rate for Hispanic or Latino students to at least 90% by 
over the next three years and to increase the overall graduation rate to 95%. After just one year of implementation, we are well on the way um, to meeting that goal. Um, it, we are really just a percent or two away. Um, so I'd like to celebrate everyone at NHS who's been working so hard to boost graduation rates for all students, especially those who have been less well served historically. And with two more years to go, I'm certain that we're going to meet that metric. Um, the goal uh, for our early literacy and numeracy measures was to close the gap between the percentage of Hispanic and Latino students scoring above the 25th national percentile, which is the cut score for concerns about potential learning problems and the percentage of white students in the same band. Here, um, we're looking at the early literacy measures. We're looking at two measures, um, letter naming fluency and letter sounds fluency. In this uh, graph, the blue lines represent uh, performance of white students on those two measures over two years, and the purple lines represent measures of Hispanic and Latino students over two years. So there's a lot of good news here on all four measures, which you'll see um, that there was improvement for students in both racial and ethnic subgroups. The only downside to the data is that performance improvements for both groups were similar in the first year, which means the gaps between the two groups remained relatively the same. So I've begun a conversation with administrators about what could be done to further accelerate gains for our Hispanic and Latino students. These are young students. This is a uh, test that's given in kindergarten. So they can actually narrow the gap so that the really the goal here is to make sure that the progress that um, the Hispanic and Latino students are making is not just linear, but geometric. Um, and here sorry, you can see. Um, sorry, Dr. Pro, a member, Sarah Cox, did you have a question on a slide that we're on now that you want to ask? Um, no, it's a previous slide. So um, the superintendent can finish his presentation and we can go back. Okay, sorry to interrupt. That's okay. And oh, here, but, uh, sorry, there was one other thing is that um, we can't see the bottom of these graphs. I don't uh, know if maybe it's zoomed in too much or something. Okay, whoops. I don't know if I can pull that out, but I can tell you they represent two years. So you're looking, the first year on this line is uh, 2020. So that would have been the, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2021, which would have been the baseline year. And then winter of 22, which is the, the year that we just had. So you see the baseline and you see the first year of implementation under the district improvement plan. Um, so thank you for that question. I don't know why it may have something to do with translation through Zoom. Um, next, uh, wanted to just once again, give a shout out to our Grand Spoon Excellence in Teaching Award winners. This uh, event took place last Wednesday night. It was the first time it was in person in the COVID era. And so once again, our uh, winners from Northampton this year were Anissa Shardle, Rebecca Herskowitz, Haley Pearl, and Sarah Churchill Windsor. Um, so congratulations one last time to our winners. It was a great night. Uh, also, as we've mentioned a couple of times already, the late start survey is coming. Here's a, um, here's a look at what that what that will look like when you see it. We'll be meeting again with our colleagues to um, share a draft and to um, plan on a communication strategy about getting this out to the community. And then um, finally, I would also just like to, since we're in the, the mode of proclamations, um, read a little bit from the governor's proclamation uh, about Nurses Day, which was yesterday. There's a, a small portion of this whereas section that I think um, is a excellent job description of what nurses have been doing for us. I saw that Lisa was on the call earlier. I um, also saw that Karen was on the call earlier. So uh, this is for you too. Whereas school nurses have served a critical role in improving public health and ensuring students' academic success for more than a hundred years, and whereas school nurses address the home and community factors, i.e. social determinate, determinants that impact students' health 
and health by promoting wellness and improving health outcomes for our nation's children. And whereas school nurses support the health and education success of children and youth by providing by providing access and care when children's cognitive development is at its peak. And whereas school nurses are members of school-based teams, i.e. health services, 504, IEP, disaster, emergency planning to address school populations. And whereas nurses understand the link between health and learning and are in a position to make positive difference for children every day. And whereas school nurses should be celebrated for their efforts in meeting the needs of today's students by improving the delivery of healthcare in our schools. And whereas school nurses contribute to our local communities by helping students stay healthy in school and ready to learn and keeping parents and guardians at work and not just this school year, but every day. It's important to remember throughout the year um, and really honor the work that our school nurses do for us. And for the last two years, they've been doing exceptional work, keeping us all safe. So um, this is a day late, but um, to all the school nurses, thank you for what you're doing. Okay, so that is my report. I'll stop the share and take any questions anyone has. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that report. Um, and congratulations on the amazing uh, work forward, you know, movement forward on the district improvement plan. Um, it's always remarkable to hear how, how uh, well we are progressing. Um, Member Sarah P. Cox. Yeah, thanks. Um, my, my question uh, piggybacks on um, what uh, Mayor Sierra was just talking about in terms of gains in the um, district improvement plan. Um, as you said, um, Superintendent Provost, you know, um, you the you put a check mark there in that box, um, and that's that's great to see that um, um, number be realized. Of course, my assumption is that you not only you said our goal is to keep it checked. My assumption is that your goal isn't just to keep it checked, but to continue to um, uh, improve that number. So I'm wondering what the process is. Uh, when a goal is met early uh, in a district improvement plan, is there a process for then revising that goal uh, more, you know, uh, to, to continue to improve on it? Well, it certainly will be a, a goal of ours to continue to improve on that because the accountability system in the state basically requires you to make increased achievement each year. So we will be um, monitoring that and, and working to continue to move that forward. I think, you know, we had set this out as an ambitious goal at, at the beginning of the district improvement plan. And so I think um, it's important to celebrate the success and, you know, not just keep moving the, the, the goalposts. I know one of the things that is most frustrating about the state accountability system is every time you reach a goal, then, the goal gets pushed farther down the road. Um, so we will continue doing that. Obviously, there are still gaps there. You know, it is still um, quite a gap, but it also does represent um, a more than doubling of literacy achievement for Hispanic and Latino students, which is actually what we saw in our data for the kindergartners as well. Um, so when I was talking about having geometric progression rather than linear progression, my my thought is, can we keep doubling that every year or getting as close to doubling that every year? Um, because that's how we'll really close down the gap. So what I'm hearing you say is that there's not a process to revise the uh, district improvement plan to, to change that goal, to you know revise it to say, this was our initial goal, we achieved it, five exclamation points, and now, well, I think what I'd like to do is keep reporting on that. But I mean, I mean, you could create a system where if you keep uh, setting higher targets every time you hit a target, you'll ensure that you never are successful with your improvement plan. You know, so I don't want to do that. I'm not. I'm not saying that then you wouldn't be successful. It's like <laughs> um, instead of getting the A, it's the A plus. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's no longer A's. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think you get my point that it's like. It, icing on the cake, but it's not icing on the cake, of course, because it's uh, overcoming deep, deep 
uh, structural educational inequalities. So of course it's not just fluff, but. Um, yeah, I know what you're saying. So, so what I'm saying is we will get new targets set based on the achievement that we attained this year from the state. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is like to keep reporting out on that and whether we're continuing to meet those targets or hopefully exceed those targets. Okay. And then, you know, in the reporting on your progress on the district improvement plan, it is then about reporting, not just a check mark, but, you know, con a continued improvement mm -hmm. uh, that, that hopefully you would see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Provost, Member Stein? Yeah, um, this is somewhat related, and you know, I have uh, I had a similar question that, that uh, Member Sarafi Cox said, and it's, you know, I I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, Dr. Bros, is was the original goal that was set like too low did, or what was, would we really over succeed in ways that we didn't expect? Like, you know, this, you know, it's hard to project out over five years or out of, over four years or whatever the period of time is gonna be exactly how the payoff for an intervention is gonna be. But I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about that, I guess, reflecting on the success that we have had in this area. Yeah, um, so I'll go back to what I said about those uh, third grade literacy achievement scores last year, we, to, to use a sports metaphor, really ran the table. You know, it was every single subgroup. Um, we were doing um, much better than our the, this the statewide cohorts, and that was for a grade that traditionally we had struggled to show strong achievement in in reading. So we had made um, a number of adjustments to curriculum, and I think those are really starting to pay off. I would say I was um, very pleasantly surprised with the, the, the performance on, on that third grade group. And that was in, in the context of COVID. Um, I had said this many times before, I'll say it again. One of the schools that had been um, struggling the greatest to increase its achievement had the highest achievement scores it's ever had um, in the midst of the of the the COVID year and that um, that definitely came as a surprise so I don't think it was a, a matter of setting a goal that was too low I think it's a matter of a lot of the things that we had put in place to try to make sure that students have high quality learning experiences are really starting to gel in a very um, supportive and reinforcing way for our students, um, and that you know, and that happened. That happened in in COVID. Um, I do you know wonder what it will be like um, when we take a look at this year's third graders, because they had a very different experience than the third graders before them, right? Um, the they had interrupted learning in kindergarten or in first and second grade year. Um, these students had interrupted learning in, in older grades. So I, I'm wondering if the impact may be stronger um, in the third grade coming up. We won't know until we, um, until we take a look at what their assessment results are like. But it, it certainly, to, from my perspective, wasn't a matter of setting a target that was too low. It was having um, a program in place with um, staff who were extremely effective with our students, who in spite of all the challenges that they were presented with having to teach remotely and having to teach in hybrid learning and having to teach, you know, we were, you know, it was almost comical how many first days of school we had last year made this happen. Um, so for me, it, it, it's more of a story of an almost miraculous overperformance than um, setting the bar too low. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. On that note, let's move forward. I, by my calculations, I think we've made it through 
right. There's nothing that I've skipped over and missed. Um, I'm going to announce the future uh, meeting dates. So negotiating subcommittee, uh, Monday, May 16th at 5 p.m. Curriculum subcommittee, Wednesday, May 18th at 5 p.m. Rules and policy subcommittee, uh, Monday, May 23rd, 3.30 p.m. Curriculum subcommittee, Wednesday, June 8th at 5 p.m. And school committee meeting on Thursday, June 9th at 6 p.m. 30 p.m. Um, and next, we are going to go into executive session. Um, and for the public that's here, we will be um, adjourning out of executive session. We will not be coming back into public open session. Um, someone want to make the motion? Or, oh, remember, Sarah Fee Cox is a long yawn happening. <laughs> Usually you, you are, I can count on you to, um, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Go for it. Um, motion to request to enter executive session under Massachusetts general law open meeting chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation and to discuss a level three grievance if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body. And the chair so declares. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Um, and again, we will be uh, adjourning in executive session. Um, roll call, please. Annie? I just want to make sure it was Member Davis that seconded it. Yes. Uh, okay. Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Shara? Yes. Member Robbins is not with us. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. And Member Agner. Yes. Okay, we're going to enter executive session. Thank you, everyone who joined us this evening.